everyone, and welcome back to the Resleevables Legends Edition. I'm your host, Cedric Phillips, at Cedric A. Phillips on all of the things, and I am joined by, as usual, my partner in crime, Patrick Sullivan, at Basic Mountain on Twitter. Patrick, I've got a feeling this is going to be our longest video yet. I can't imagine it's not. <laughs> okay. Going back and looking at Arabian Nights and Antiquities, there's a lot to go over uh, with those sets, of course. Early on in Magic's history, new mechanics, all that kind of stuff. But the sets themselves are fairly small. Yes. They're in the range of 80 unique cards, maybe upwards of 100 if you want to count. Uh, misprints or different arts or, you know, light shade versus dark shade, whatever. But we're talking a, really just a couple dozen cards to go over this set is hundreds and hundreds of cards including a uh, new card super type a lot of rules associated with that a handful of new mechanics besides that and just a ton of random designs many of which do very little to nothing <laughs> yep so there's a lot to go over uh when i was doing my research for the show and the script and running through the entire set on scryfall it was a tough read. It does start to blur together. It certainly. does. A lot of the cards were really bad, but their heart was in the right place. I think they got some things right here. Mm -hmm. There's some good things here. There's This is our first episode where I'd say there's quite a bit of bad. Yeah. I'd say for the first handful of episodes we've done, it's mostly been, you know, getting the foundation in place. And now this is another big swing with a lot of cards. And there is there is some bad here. There's a lot of really good, too. Of course. A, a lot of the stuff that appeared for the first time in Legends is definitional parts of basically every Magic expansion that gets released nowadays. Yes. So that's really, really good. But there's a number, I shouldn't say a number, quite a few cards that do very little to nothing. Yes. Most of the strongest cards in the set are miserable. That, that is true. <laughs> Absolutely miserable. Yep. But, you know, it's early on. You're still sort of getting your feet wet with some of the stuff. And mm -hmm. a lot of highs, a lot of lows. Well, we're going to go over all of those things here today. And, of course, to get things underway, we are starting with the Facts of Legends. All right, everyone. We are here with the Facts of Legends. But before we start things off... We got a sponsor first one best one somebody likes the show our friends over at tales of adventure are sponsoring the facts of legends patrick you haven't done an ad read in a long time my friend you still got it i do okay well you can find tales of adventure all over the place there's a physical store in eastern pennsylvania if you go to pretty much any magic event one of the large ones in the United States, they will be there vending. But most importantly, what you can do is head over to toamagic.com. That is where you can find their website for singles and sealed product. I personally do a lot of my high-end buy, sell, trade with them. Super ethical, super clean, uh, very reliable shipping, great communication, all of that. Another really nice thing about going to them is when you go to their high-end page, every single card is individually scanned. So you know exactly what you're looking at before you go ahead and purchase. I don't know of any other large retailer that uh, has a service like that. And that makes it way more confidence building when you're spending, you know, you're buying a dual land, you're buying some cards from Beta or Arabian Nights, whatever the case may be, actually getting to see the thing uh, instead of just having it flagged HP or near man or who knows what that stuff means. Sure. Having it all individually uploaded means you can have a lot of confidence when you're purchasing your cards. So again, toamagic.com, that's Tales of Adventure. I personally vouch for them. I use them for a lot of my high-end transactions. Just bought a Beta Tundra from them, yep. came in, looks great. Better than advertised as always. So thank you for the sponsorship. And again, toamagic.com, that's Tales of Adventure. Coopersburg. Pennsylvania. Crushed it. Crushed it. Been a long time since we had Matt Reed from you. I'm proud of you. Thanks. Never lost it. It's easy when you actually use the service. That's true. That's also true. <laughs> yes. Yes. Makes it like organic and actually right, meaningful. Right, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, let's dive in to our facts of the set. Legends, 
It's the seventh Magic the Gathering set and the third Magic the Gathering expansion. Legends is the first expansion to be sold in booster packs of 15 cards. Remember, previous expansions were sold in packs of eight. So this set has a lot of cards, and that means you got to put more of them into booster packs. Exactly. <laughs> if you think about the eight-card boosters, as a percentage of the set, an eight-card booster for Arabian Nights is like 10% of the set. Yeah. There's only like 80 or 85 cards or whatever the case may be. So they had to gas it up a little bit this time because there's 300 some odd <laughs> cards. And uh, that 15-card booster is basically uh, what has gone forward with. There's a couple of sets after Legends that we'll get to that go back to eight or like kind of weird numbers. Uh, but this was the first 15. And uh, the set really needed it because there's so many cards. There, there are a lot of them. Some Legends booster boxes contained only one portion of the possible uncommon cards, while others contained a different portion. So this is a weird thing that's going on. Probably with that injection of more cards, maybe mistaken how they were going to be divvied up into the booster packs. These A and B boxes elicited widespread complaints from frustrated players and collectors because I imagine players and collectors kept getting part A when they were trying to get part B and having no control over this. Uh it is especially bad with a set this big. Yes. Of like, I can't even get half of the uncommon sure. to, to begin with. Sure. Uh, it's a, a very frustrating set to get a bunch of duplicates of without getting your first copy of whatever is on the other half. Mm -hmm. Again, as a function of the set size. Wizards of the Coast not only acknowledged that this was a problem, but they responded with the Legends Exchange Program allowing consumers to trade in up to 100 cards from one group of uncommon cards for an equal number of cards from the other group. This is another thing that I never heard of mm -hmm. uh, until we started doing this show. Okay. And I was kind of around. I, you know, I, I wasn't playing exactly when Legends was released, but close enough where I thought that I would have heard about things like this. Sure. Were they real? But yeah, there's a lot of weird buyback programs in early Magic. Just trying to f solve some problems. That's right. all. It's yeah. not perfect out, out, out the off the jump. Well, it's also keep in mind at the time, like the company's much smaller. You're pre-internet, so your communications like a lot trickier to kind of get across. Yep. And so you kind of have to come up with these ad hoc solutions to customer service issues. And so a lot of this stuff kind of resembles more of how a mom and pop shop would handle something. Yeah, absolutely. Than a, a, a massive corporation like Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast. But that was kind of what it was at the time. It was closer to a, a family shop than it was to a publicly traded company. Now, we've talked about just how large this set is. Legends contains 310 black bordered cards, 75 commons, 114 uncommons, and 121 rares. So no basics. Correct. So it's three. It's 310, like legit 310. Yeah, like cards that you need. Or new, don't need. New designs. Yes. A few functional reprints, but basically 300 new cards. Uh, it was released in June 1994. The print run was estimated to be 35 million cards. Uh, Legends was available from mid-June 94 through late June 1994, and each pack includes a rule card. Explained all the abilities and card types introduced in the set did this rules card. However, as you mentioned, Legends did not contain any basic lands, so therefore it was, it was not considered a standalone expansion. And as a result, there were no Legends starter decks. Keep in mind, again, the 35 million uh, of the print run, that is much larger than we saw in Antiquities and Arabian Nights, mm -hmm. but also the set is significantly larger. And so the cards are comparable in terms of overall rarity to the cards from those earlier sets. Uh, so we're still talking about it's hard to find this stuff. Yes. There's very, very little of it. And as you mentioned, the whole thing sold out in two weeks. Yeah. Mid-June I mean, to end of June. It's gone pretty quick yeah. as far as availability is concerned. Again, I started playing Magic at, uh, you know, Christmas time of this year. And there's no chance you could find Legends boosters. Yeah. That's six months later. Wow. that's. Boring. Imagine a set that came out nowadays where six months later it's it's just gone. There's none of it. Yeah, it's unfathomable. Right. Yeah. Different time. Uh, Legends went on to win the Gamma Award for Best Game Accessory of the Year in 1994. Gamma is a trade show that has taken place in the United States. Um, more often than not, nowadays, it takes place in Reno, Nevada. Mm -hmm. I actually 
I uh, had to go work it twice when I was working for Ultimate Guard. So I've been. It's a pretty cool show. Oddly enough, I've never worked that show. Okay. Even though I've worked on board games and worked on trading card games, the stars have just never aligned. I think they've had it in Las Vegas a handful of it's times. Been in Ve- it, it was in Vegas yeah. before it moved to Reno. Yeah, so yeah. I know of the show, but weirdly enough, it's one of the major um, American gaming conventions I've never been at. Now, here's the fun thing. Legends is the oldest Magic expansion that was released in Italian. So there are Italian Legends packs that do exist. Can we confirm? Can we confirm we can. that? You know, as much as I love Tales of Adventure, that sponsorship, that TOA Magic.com read, yeah. didn't come for zero. No, 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 it didn't. No, we got the hookup. We got the hookup. Again, great place to go for your old school Magic needs. We were sent two Legende Boosters. <laughs> Apologies, my Italian's not great. <laughs> Two Italian Legends booster packs here. We are going to be opening these up on a separate video that yes. will be linked here. Uh, but I, I these have been burning a hole in my pocket now for three or four days. I can't wait to get in there. The discipline. Yes. Is, it is impressive. A game that we're going to try to play in the video is seeing if I could recognize what the cards do. Okay. And their names. I have something of a reputation of being uh, something of a historian of this era. I would call you very much a historian. There's people who are way more familiar with everything, but as far as it goes, I know quite a bit. This set is so big, and so many of the cards are so pointless <laughs> that I, I, I think that opening up two booster packs, so 15 cards, 30 cards total. Okay. I would guess name and text box under 50 percent okay but we will see okay we will see all right uh that's something for you lovely people to look forward to uh legend set symbol let's talk about that it's a capital of a column was meant to evoke a time of legends i think this is a good set symbol sure Yeah, yeah i'm a fan uh the set it was designed by steve connard and robin herbert now, Steve is a former magic designer and a founder of Wizards of the Coast. And while Robin is a former magic designer who contributed to Legends, I've got a little bit more of a story there in just a moment for you. But first, I do want to let you know that Legends was, de- uh, excuse me, developed by Scaphalias, Jim Lynn, Chris Page, and Dave Petty, names that we have said quite a bit on this mm-hmm. show so far. So here's how Legends came to be. Bear with me because for the first time in our show, it's really time for story time. In the late 1980s, Steve Conard was one of the five founders of Wizards of the Coast in Peter Atkinson's basement. Mm -hmm. That's how all good companies start. During this time, Richard Garfield was introduced to Peter, and they began working on a game concept that would eventually become magic. Steve, however, married a Canadian girl and moved in 1991 to Vancouver, B.C., a lovely place. So I've heard. It's Oh, you've never been? No. Oh, it's great. It's great. While working for a software company, he met Robin Herbert. Meanwhile, he continued to work on freelance projects for Wizards, which meant an occasional trip to Seattle. One day while at Watsi, Peter introduced him to Magic. The next trip to Seattle, he took Robin, did Steve, with him, and by the end of the weekend, the game had them in its grips. That's how you know the story's true. Yes. Magic will just, it does that to you. The yet. first time you experience it, you're like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. Steve and Robin quickly became addicted and started making their own cards for fun on their own time based on the epic fantasy that both of them enjoyed. A few months later, Steve and Robin began designing their own set, but still on a casual basis. Many of the ideas for Legends came from notes taken by Steve on Watsi's Christmas recreational outing to Mount Rainier. And one of those ideas was to create a more unique, heroic kind of creature that would have a sense of depth and strength. This led to the creation of legendary creatures, as well as other mythical sounding creatures such as Hell's Caretaker and Evil Eye of Orms by Gore. Many of the ideas used for legendary creatures came from the Dungeons and Dragons campaign enjoyed by those involved. So I've been playing magic for a very long time. You've been playing magic for a very long time. I've never asked you this question before. Have you ever tried to design your own set? No, I, not as such. Okay. I mean, I, I've worked on magic design, um, but that process is, first of all, I wasn't doing it for, for very long or very intensely. And second, at this point, it's such a collaborative process. It's not one person or two people locked in a room. There's vision design and then initial design and then play design and all of them have different parts of the process that they shape in terms of designing my own set as just sort of like a casual project. Oddly enough, no, 
now that you mention it, it's weird that I never really took a stab at that. Yeah. Figured at some point maybe I would have, but no, I can't say that I have. That makes two of us. Never yep. tried. I don't even think now this is pro I'm probably incorrect about this. Younger me would probably be yelling at older me right now, but I don't think I ever really tried to design magic cards at any point in my life. Mm -hmm. it just seemed kind of overwhelming and daunting. And I just, you know, enjoy the game for what it is and the cards that people create. At this stage of my life, now that I've been playing magic for so long, when new cards do come out, I do kind of critique them and stuff like that. But as far as like designing my own, like no. So it, hard. It's weird for me. I never even had the concept of magic cards being designed by people. Sure. Until I kind of started, maybe, maybe started playing the pro tour and interacting with some of the people over at wizards and picking their brains a little bit and then starting to work in game design in, you know, 2003, 2004. But when I was at like a teenager playing with these cards, it never occurred to me that there were people making them. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. It sounds obvious. Obviously someone has to be making <laughs> sure, them. Right? Where, where are they but coming from? It was just, you know, like one day a set came out and then there are some cards. Okay. The idea that someone or a group of people were doing it as a job just never occurred to me. And I, I think because of that, it never occurred to me to make my own set because that's not the process. They sure. just exist one day. No? Okay. Weird. Uh, more to the story. The expansion Legends was originally named The Legend Continues in order to pay homage to the original game, but it was shortened to just Legends by those involved. Peter Atkinson later asked to review the set they had created, and it was quickly accepted because the upcoming Ice Age set was delayed. Remember that in Antiquities, the Silex Blast set the world into the Ice Age, so it would make sense that that was supposed to be the next set. Right. And we had a little bit of delay, which happens in game design and this sort of thing. Sets get delayed. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Peter and Scaff Elias came to Vancouver to discuss Legends. A playtest system needed to be established. SCAF was to be the liaison between the design team and the East Coast playtesters in Philadelphia. The development of Legends followed, which was complicated by communication issues, because remember, this is not the age of the internet, folks. You gotta call, pick up the phone. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not just that. It's, it's not, not, just a, not a, it's like not a, not a cell phone. Yeah. There's a phone where you did, you do this to <laughs> the, dial the, the rotary phone. The rotary phone, yes. And then you have to hope the other person's there. Right. Right. On the other side when you call. Yeah. Okay. So the communication was a little bit different as the language found on the cards was not yet standardized. It was sometimes di difficult for the developers who were across the country in Philadelphia to understand what the cards were intended to do. After a face to face meeting between the design and development teams, however, many cards intentions were clarified. There was little concern about casting costs. So when an effect was too powerful or in the wrong color, Instead, its casting cost was increased. So, <laughs> let's dive into this a little bit. Nowadays, as you are watching this on YouTube or our Patreon, this is just normal. We make an episode, we bought some cameras, we built this thing behind us, right? It gets edited by, edited by our wonderful editor, John. Ray makes all these awesome graphics. I can review them on Slack, blah, blah, blah. This is just the world that we all live in now. But we, you and I, have this unique thing of we lived pre-internet and post-internet. So this is very humorous to me because I'm thinking about life pre-internet and it's just like, yeah, this had to be the biggest pain in the butt to just go like, hey, uh, what do you mean by this card? And it's like, what do you mean? What do I mean? It's pretty obvious. And it's like, it's not. Well, it's funny. One, that the, that's the, the process. Yeah. And, you know, the technology at the time was what it was, but yep. it in no way resembles anything analogous to how things are done nowadays. No. But it's also funny to think that there was a concept of playtesting, and if a card was seen to be problematic on power level, the mana cost would go up by one. And thinking about how putrid most of the legends are, mm -hmm. the legends legends, like how many times did Lady Orca get nerfed? <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? Okay. Especially comparing it to, you know, the mana drains and nether voids of the world. Like, did those cards start at like one and three or were they perceived to be fine? Neither answer is good, but now I'm curious. <laughs> sure. Sure. So uh, a brief story that I don't know if I've ever told you before. Um, when I was learning how to play magic, uh, I don't remember exactly how old I was, whatever, but there was a sky, there was a sky blue deck in like mass block. Uh, yeah. Um, um, yeah. The days thwart the flying creatures. What's like a, there was like a three mana four, four that like, I think when it indentured Jin. Someone draws cards. It's a four, four flyer for three ETB, you ancestral them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
And then, like, I think maybe Rising Waters was included and Thwart and Foil and all this other stuff, right? Yeah, Rising Waters is really good with making them draw three because it doesn't matter if they can't play anything. Correct. So, why am I bringing up this deck? Because my best Magic playing friend at the time, Brian Stoya, who lived, like, down the road, you know, like a couple developments over, and this is before we could drive, we would go to the Junior Super Series. Mm -hmm. But how were we supposed to test with each other? I'll tell you how ring a ding ding on the rotary phone so i would call him at like six o'clock or seven o'clock after like school and be like yo do you want to play test i'm playing uh stompy like mono green with like pouncing jaguar or whatever the heck i was playing at the time and he's playing his sky blue his sky blue deck and we have physical copies of the deck some of our cards were proxied and i'm just like yeah i have my opening hand do you have your opening hand it's like yes now again remember this is in a time of not cell phones. This is in a time of also where like, if I'm using the phone, that's it. No one else can use the phone. Okay. And the same thing for Brian. So we're just on the phone. And I'm like, yeah, I, I just played a forest and a pouncing Jaguar. Go ahead. And he's like, all right, I've just played an Island. Go ahead. Right. And we're just sucking up the bandwidth on the phone. And then like my mom would be like, Hey, I have to call like your grandmother. I'm like, yeah, the thing is like we're on turn four. Mm -hmm. So if that's my experience and we're just like playing games to get ready for like a tournament, we're not going to win. I can only imagine what their experience is just like, yeah, this card costs five and it does this. And uh, then the other, you being like, that needs to cost six. And then just arguing about it. Yeah. Just arguing about that. I have a question now about your play testing over the phone, because I also did that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hit me. Yes. Did you, uh, ever accused or were ever accused of cheating in the phone game glad you asked no okay we were very like we were very clean and professional like we're not cheating now were there moments where maybe i thought there's no way you have like a third thor <laughs> yes yes but like am i going to accuse my best magic playing friend of cheating on our phone games no that's the thing you got to be real sure yeah i couldn't yeah. do it yeah i couldn't do it yeah oh it's like oh you got uh you got turned to him again huh that's interesting Mm. yeah sure sure mm. and this is also like during a time where like you're a kid you don't really know any better it's like you really want to like beat your friend oh then like how bad do you want to i must have friend? been on a very different competitive arc than you because it very quickly entered my head the idea of someone cheating <laughs> sure okay sure but sure. well, whatever <laughs> different cultures maybe new jersey versus ohio i i also <laughs> love too that once the internet started coming around you know this is when there was dial-up internet which some people may not be familiar with who are watching the show but basically like it blocked your landline if you were on the internet mm -hmm. and also like if you were on the, I don't know if, I don't know if you remember this experience, but like if you were on the phone and like someone tried to come on the internet, like you could hear it in the phone like that. Beep, yes. boop, beep, boop, and it's like, Hey, I'm on the phone. Yep. Hey, the thing is I'm on the phone, but the internet wasn't good enough back then. So it's like, Hey, let's take this conversation to the internet and like, I'll upload a photo of the card. You can tell me what you think. Like, that's just not a thing. It was, it was cleaner to play test over the phone. Yes. Yeah. yeah right. So like this, everything that we have now did not exist. So, this idea of like these two people, Steve and Robin, like making a set, how are we going to play test the set? We're on the East Coast. You guys are on the West Coast. We'll have some phone calls, all this other stuff. I cannot imagine how laborious this was. No, this sounds like a nightmare, especially, again, uh, to to reemphasize, there's 310 unique designs. <laughs> sure, set. sure. It's, it's, it would be rough even if you were doing like an 85 card antiquity set. Yeah. So it makes sense that, like, if there are some cards that are maybe a little too powerful or horrible that maybe slip through the cracks, at some point someone just has to go, yeah, that card's fine. Let's move on to the next we one. We can't talk about this forever. Yeah, we can't just yep. litigate every design for an hour. So, you know what? Mana Drain, too blue, better than Counterspell? Whatever. Well, yes and no better than ma It's balanced around Mana oh, Burn. right. There is Mana Burn. Well, That's well, right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Okay, we'll get to that later. Uh, a couple of more facts, not many more. The idea behind world enchantments, okay, that's a new card type we're going to get to, was that they were magic so powerful, they transported the battle to another plane altogether. So now, if you're with us for the pre-sleevables, we discuss battles in March of the Machine, which is a new card type, mm -hmm. which is like not exactly a world enchantment but kind of world enchantment it's like a brand new card and now previously there were world enchantments now those are gone what was your experience like playing with whatever the heck these things were well um these some of these got reprinted in chronicles okay or at least concordant crosswords did that one was 
uh, in terms of my, you know, like very early sort of juvenile tournament experience, by which I mean play, playing type one, basically anything goes, but no one had moxes or whatever Yep. Uh, at the local shop. And Concordant Crossroads was a useful card because, one, if your opponent was playing a creature list deck, uh, then it, you were just free rolling. Your okay. stuff has haste and they're not getting anything out of it. But more importantly, because of the Enchant World rules, it was also a way of uh, destroying opposing uh, Nether Voids and the Abysses. Because you can only have one world enchantment, right? Right. Weirdly enough, uh, they actually kind of started with the current legend rules which is like second one in can trump the the first one if you're playing over the top of yourself. Yep. Um, but Concordant Crossroads was a big thing because against creature creatureless or creature light decks, one, they were likely to have the nether nether void or the abyss anyway. So it was a good answer to that. And then you also were taking advantage of everything having haste and your opponent really wasn't. So that card was a pretty big part of my early I don't know if you want to call it competitive, but local card shop building decks and starting to play sort of thing um as that that was the most impactful one in terms of it's an enchant world and it matters that enchant that it's an enchant world okay the other ones nether void the abyss people had them in some decks but it wasn't like it mattered very much that they were enchant worlds because you could only afford one in the first place and your opponent had no chance of winning if you ever resolved it so <laughs> like who, who even needs to know the rules okay. speaking of that was probably my favorite judge call in uh any tournament setting Okay, I was playing in a SCG Invitational many years ago, and I just looked over to the match next to me, and someone had uh, the Abyss and Nether Void in play at the same time. You can't do that. Right. Ooh. And I was like, stop the match, stop the match, stop uh, the match. The only person and in the room that knows. <laughs> stop the match, stop the match, stop the match, right? And they're both panicking, and I was like, I don't know, uh, you know, when you stop a match, usually, if you're a spectator stopping a match, it's usually because, like, you think someone's cheating, right? Yeah, sure. So they're both panicking. Yeah. And I was like, uh, they were kind of giving me a look like panicking like what what do you think you saw or whatever what are you going to accuse me of and i'm like it's really funny it's probably going to be fine but the board state right now is not clean and they're like looking around like you know and i was like two inch judge comes over and i'm like two enchant worlds uh duh duh yeah. <laughs> what is this your first tournament <laughs> I don't even know how they cleaned that up. I guess what the second one. Yeah, the, the, it's, it's the second one. The is, second one stays, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, play okay. where it lands. Second one stays. Okay. It was fine. Okay. No one got. It was, there was a warning issued. I think. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I wouldn't even give a punishment because who knows that rule? It's just like you're fine. No, you should give a punishment because those cards are actually really good in play with each other. <laughs> sure. Because okay. the only the only way to play over the top of the abyss is by casting multiple creatures in a turn and sort of like sacrificing and getting second end. Sure. So with Nether Void in the mix. There's no way you can play multiple cards in a turn. That's true. And so That's it true. does actually matter. Okay. All right. You're right. You're right. Uh, <laughs> I got one final fact here. Uh, originally, uh, Richard Garfield believed that it was all right for the larger expansions like Legends and Ice Age to optionally use common cards from Alpha. So I'll explain this real quick. The Ice Age, the Ice Age expansion, which included commons from Alpha, was supposed to be released uh, after Antiquities. But as we mentioned... A little bit of a delay on things. Uh, but Alpha was released while it was being created, and it became obvious that the fans would not be pleased with rehashed commons so soon. Legends, which has all new commons, was put on the fast track to be published in Ice Age's place, which was postponed until more new cards could be created for it. So mm -hmm. this is the life of trying to appease your audience because you want to be creating new content, right? You don't want to just be doing Reprint City. Uh, we already have history of people complaining about the too many reprints or um, like I, in this particular set, I'm getting Uncommons A as opposed to Uncommons B, right? And so they have to do their buyback program and stuff like that. And these are going to be just speed bumps for a brand new company that's releasing so many cards now and trying to figure out what the release cycle is going to be, how many card sets should be, what sets should look like, all this other stuff. So this is a unique problem to have, which, you know, nowadays Magic doesn't really have anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't even I don't even this isn't like a blip on the radar. You know, there are going to be some number of reprints. I know we all like to laugh about Colossal Dreadmaw being in sets over and over and over again to the point where like people actually kind of like it because it's like a fun joke. But when this game was getting started, it's like, yo, we need I've already played with this card a bunch. Can we get like a new version of this card or just a new card in general? And uh, Legends allowed them to do that. 
it's one way of sort of fighting the complexity creep that naturally will occur over time is just using old stuff. Um, some of that is people will be familiar with the design naturally. Although I think a lot of the cards in that were reissued in Legends are just vanillas. Mostly, yeah. But it's very easy to fall in the trap of, well, we've got a everything's going to have text. Everything has to have a power. No, doesn't. Mm-hmm. It actually makes the uh, world feel less complete because in a random fantasy setting, a lot of things wouldn't do anything except fight. So actually vanillas make sense. Yep. Not everything would have a power. And also, sometimes you just get the stats and mana costs right the first time. And sitting there trying to figure out how to tinker around is like, it was like really a waste of time. Sure. It seems weird nowadays to think of people rejecting the idea of uh, grizzly bears getting a functional reprint. Sure. Why would you care about this at all? <laughs> sure, sure. Keep in mind, though, at the time, we're talking about Alpha, Beta, Unlimited, Revised, which is the same, you know, 300 collection of cards. Mm-hmm. And then Arabian Nights and Antiquities, which were both under 100 new designs. Mm -hmm. So it might seem silly, but at the time when there's maybe 500 unique cards, it does actually sting a little bit to just get, oh, this is Grizzly Bears, but it's called Barbary Apes now. Yeah, sure. Now with tens of thousands of cards and and just sort of the the consumer base sort of changing a little bit and how they uh, handle certain things. There's more of an appetite for it. And it's just kind of good practice to do some amount of it. Yep. But at the time this was actually controversial. People were annoyed by it. Yeah. And I think justifiably so. So there's so there's so few game pieces. Yeah. How could you possibly just be reprinting five of them already when uh, there's only like five reprints is that's like 1% of the card pool. Yeah. That exists. Yes. So it, it's just a different time and place, but I was there and people were annoyed by it. I imagine that uh, they probably had a phone call or two about that. Yeah. On their, on yeah, their, yeah, on their, yeah, on their yeah. rotaries. Just a ring-a-ding-ding-ding. I'm doing this like it's a cell phone when it should be more like, I don't, I have a water bottle. Like right. just, it's like, and you, do you remember this? You got to do this. Yeah. I can't even do it with this water bottle. Yeah. It's just like, you have to like tilt your head. And you'd walk around the kitchen, but you can only go so far because of the cord. Yeah. Uh, you're just, sitting there, oh. you're sitting there at your desk at, in uh you know seattle or at the campus of upenn you're working on a paper on your typewriter <laughs> your phone rings you pick it up hello and someone's like what is the deal with barbary apes? <laughs> i already own grizzly bears what is the deal with barbary apes and that's just your day it's just working on your typewriter and occasionally getting a uh, getting a call harassing you about headless horseman or raging bull or whatever like i said different time different time now we have chat gpt yeah that's yeah, gonna yeah. be making sense soon right. like this phone call nonsense anyway those are the facts of legends when we do come back we're going to dive into the mechanics like legendary lands the legend rule and bands with other we'll see you back here for that in just a sec All right, everybody, we are back for the mechanics of Legends, of which there are many. So let's dive in and start with the namesake mechanic of Legends Mm -hmm. and what they are. Uh, Unique creatures which represent important characters in a set story. The original type line for Legends said, quote, summon legend, unquote. But that was later changed to legendary creature, and they were given creature types Nowadays, obviously, we see legendary creatures all the time. They are, you know, they have creature types and also they're jazz. You know, I'm thinking of like Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. It's a human, goes in all the humans' decks, triggers humans, synergies, all that other stuff, right? But that's not how things were way back in the day. And this is, I think, a really, really cool idea of we need to make creatures that are significant to the story that are probably going to be more powerful than other things that are going on. It also serves a mechanical need. Okay. A, a, a problem that, even if it's not the intent at the time, there is something good game design-wise going on here because something that Magic and really all trading card games have to push back against is why aren't players just playing the maximum number of copies of their best cards? Okay. And Legends is a, a move as a super type, legendary permanence of all sorts, mm-hmm. is a subtle way, not always successful, but a subtle way of... You know, maybe you play two or three copies of this thing. Mix up the numbers a little bit. Right. Okay. And when you start playing with two and threes, 
that opens up more slots for you to play maybe one or two of some other stuff. And then decks just naturally have more diversity because you really feel the pain of drawing multiple copies of your same legend. You know, like I said, it doesn't always work in practice. Some legends are cheap enough and powerful enough. Ragavan, Thalia, as you mentioned, where you just play four copies and you just suck it up. Sometimes you draw multiple copies, uh, but you don't really care because the card's so powerful. Although you even in those with those cards, you do feel the pain of drawing multiple copies sometimes. Absolutely. So even if you do play four, you there is a tax associated with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it's nice to sort of sort of subtly ease people towards playing two and three copies, one copy of things. And Legends is a really good way of doing that. Let's talk about the legendary lands. Now, these are unique lands which, which represent important places in a set story. Again, you see this very much now in modern magic of legendary lands. How many copies do you want to play? That's negotiable, but they are definitely pieces to the story that they want to evoke of this land is very important and it has a powerful ability associated with it as well because it is such an a important and powerful card. Yep, uh, although they have gotten away from that Um they make legendary lands with much less frequency. And I think that's correct. I think balancing a creature around, yeah, if you draw the second or third copy, your opponent doesn't kill the first one, that kind of stings. Mm -hmm. You might be down a card for a while is a lot different than my opening hand is two copies of Caracas and therefore I cannot play a second land. Yes. So magic has still does a lot with legends and you can kind of, count planeswalkers as being certainly cribbing a lot of the mechanical space of legendary creatures as well. The legendary lands also are a feature of this set and still kind of exist and have sort of this, you know, up and down history of how frequently are they printed over magic's history. But I think there's a very different argument about the lands versus the creatures. Creatures, very, very good. Lands, a lot sketchier. I agree. I agree. Uh, Let's talk about the legend rule. Yeah. Or at least the former legend rule. Mm Mm-hmm. Under the legend rule, way back when here in Legends, if a legend or legendary land was on the battlefield, no player could cast the same legend or play the same legendary land. Under current rules, as we now know it in Modern Magic, if a player controls two or more legendary permanents with the same name, that player chooses one of them and the rest are put into their owner's graveyard. So nowadays, if I control a... Nick those Shrine and X, and then I play another one. I have to choose which one I want to keep. The other one is destroyed. Okay, fine. Uh, same thing can be said for legendary creatures and planeswalkers. However, way back in the day, this was not the case. If you look at some old competitive deck lists, you will see this coming up. You okay. will you can find mono red goblins with four copies of Telerian Academy in the sideboard. Why would this deck have Telerian Academy in the sideboard? It did, can't do anything with blue mana. It has no artifacts. And that is because if you were on the play and went turn one Academy, your opponent whose deck is built around to learn Academy could not play theirs. Okay. So if you go through some of magic's earlier competitive deck lists, you can see a little bit of this overwhelmingly. It involves to Academy, but there's some smaller examples as well. There's actually a rule in between current rules and that rule, which is they're both destroyed. Yes. Uh, which was, I believe happened after Pro Tour Venice, where around that time, memory serves, I might be confusing this a little bit, but I I know it was seen as the, I play mine and now you're locked out was just too extreme. Yeah. This was a middle ground. I think the world where we each can just have one is the best world possible. Just like let people play with their cards, who cares? Yep. Um, But there was an evolution from Legends being the strictest and most harsh rules to kind of the most forgiving version of it possible, which is what we have now. So here's my recollection of the legendary rule. The oldest version of this rule, um, the thing that stands out to me the most, even though I wasn't playing at this time, so correct me if I'm wrong, well, wasn't playing competitively, excuse me, was like Lin Civy. If I had Lin Civy and you didn't, like it's just a wrap. Right. Okay, so that was like in the Rebel's Mirror. Yep. The middle ground, which was if I played, if you had a legendary permanent and then I played one, they both dest- got destroyed. The the, one, the the example that stands to me the most was Kamigawa Block with Umazawa Shite. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, onslaught block with just a litany of legendary creatures. Okay, sure, like Silvos and that stuff. Uh, Chroma. Yeah, okay, great. People, yeah. yeah, so Umazawa Shite during Kamigawa Block, it was the best card. Um, and it was just like, you know, I have one of my, in my white weenie deck and then you like, you played one and then boom, they're both destroyed. But the person who had Jute 
and already got to like attack and hit with it, got a little bit of yeah. advantage, remove the counters, whatever. But you know, now you've solved that problem. Now you have to solve the rest of the problems. And I also remember Opal Eye. You needed to kill that in the mirror, so someone would play one, then you play yours to get that thing out of here. Uh, and now there is the current legendary rule, of course, which is yeah, I, I have Numazawa Jite. You have Numazawa Jite. It's Fine. an interesting thing about um, the earlier rules and uh, just some game design stuff going on there in general, which was this rule was always really bad. It just didn't matter because it didn't come up. Okay. You could argue even then, you know, when Tolarian Academy is running rampant and people are dying on turn one in type two and standard, it's actually nice for people to have something they get sideboard that could be useful. Sure. Because so many things don't work. Yep. But setting aside the Academy example, most of the legends from legends up until Mercadian Masks with Lin Civi and then Onslaught, which is a variety of legendary creatures that were good enough to play, the car the legends were unplayable. So it wasn't like we had legend mirror matches where we're feeling the I was on the play, I put Lin Civi on turn three, and now the game's a wrap because you're locked out of playing the best card. Yeah. And I have it running. That rule is really bad, but it just was not really discovered as being a problem until a couple of sets and key cards made legends and mirror matches involving the same legends come up more frequently. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and like flavorfully, flavor wise, excuse me, I understand why they had the rule be what it was initially. It's like I can, I, I, this legendary creature and I are teaming up. It's the most flavorful version of the rule. So how can you have a Lin Civi when I, Lin Civi's on my team, right? So we can't both have one. But once you kind of hand wave that, it's like, yeah, you got to fix this. This is a problem. It's horrible. Yeah, it's absolutely horrible. Uh, multicolored cards also debuted in Legends. Cards with uh, which require more than one color to play. We call them gold cards. You can call them multicolor. Oh, down the road, Magic has hybrid cards and all this other stuff, so they've really kind of expanded on this territory, but this is where it all began. It's fascinating that both Legend, the super type, and gold cards were and are extremely beloved, and they are just drawbacks. You can't have a second one, okay. and this card's harder to cast. Yeah. That's what it actually means in practice. And because the idea of a singular storyline character or a frame that's gold or how do two and three color cards work, what design space does that, does that open up? The fact that those mechanics were so popular at the time, they continue to be used. They're essentially evergreen and they're just drawbacks. Sure. It says a lot about how great the space is, how cool the gold frame is. Like that counts for a lot. It yep. looks cool. Yep. Uh, just really, it, it's a cool thing to go and look back at. And it still works today. Oh, of course. It, I mean, it, they're still doing it. And people still love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, they do. They do. Enchant world cards. Now they're called world enchantments. Let's talk about these a little bit. I know we discussed them a little in the facts section, but... These enchantments would change the player environment for all players. When Enchant World enters the battlefield, all other Enchant World cards in play are destroyed. So again, the idea behind these is you're moving to an entirely different world where one specific thing is going on. You mentioned uh, Concordant Crossroads? Yes. I think it's called, so all creatures have haste. Yep. I think that was a single green? Okay, great. So now like, you know, everything's sped up. My creatures have haste, your creatures have haste. We're attacking right away. Cool. There's the world in which you're playing underneath the abyss. A little bit less fun, probably. Mm -hmm. The world where you're playing underneath Nether Void, which I'm laughing because that's a card I wanted as a kid, but I could never afford. Yeah. And I remember seeing deck lists, either like in, like an inquest or duelist or something that had that. I'm like, that card's so cool. They don't get to do it. I was very much the person who wanted to stop the opponent from like doing stuff, make them want to have a miserable time, which is still true. Um, but I just never could afford it. Eugene had so many of them. Okay. He had like, <laughs> I think he had the entire print run of Nether Void. <laughs> It's so. I played. It says a lot about how great Magic is. Where that I love the game, in spite of playing so much under Nether Void. Yeah, just <laughs> spells just can't ever cast them. It's kind of a weird thing because there's uh symmetrical enchantments in the set that are not world enchantments. Okay. Which kind of breaks the conceit a little eh, bit. Maybe got lost in the phone like call. Moat. Yeah. Moat is you a would symmetrical. Think, you would think right. that would be a world enchantment. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, you could call it something like someone's moat or someone's castle or sure. whatever and then yeah. do it so there's some weird stuff going on that breaks the uh 
creative conceit a little bit because there's like i said other symmetrical enchantments in the set that are not in world enchantments but yeah we the 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 tone of what was going on basically came across it was a little weird that the names were i guess the abyss is kind of like that sort of signifies a singular place in realm but a lot of these places have kind of non-legendary names okay it sounds like there could be a lot of concordant crossroads. Sure. There could be a lot of nether voids. So I, I think this could have come across a little bit more clearly if the names were tuned a little bit to sound more legendary. Well, it's it's funny, right? Because the solve to this, I'm just thinking this right now, is if you just put the in front of a lot of them. Yeah. So the nether void, the concordant crossroads. It helps a lot. Yeah. And it's like just that because if it were just abyss, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. But when you say it's the abyss... Like, it kind of changes some things and how your mind kind of wraps around what's going on, mm-hmm. right? And I think, like, just the use of the might have solved that problem for all of them. It also would have given them more legs to my favorite bit on coverage, which was saying, uh, the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about... That's why you don't use the a lot that's, that's... on cards. You're absolutely correct in terms of tying the whole thing together sure. and making it more obvious what's an enchant world and what isn't, which is especially important when the the set's in Italian and sure. the cards are a lot cheaper. Sure. So people are playing with Italian cards all the time. Uh, but the is a little... It, it, uh, the Tabernacle of Pendle Vale is... It's a t- that's a tough read. It's a little sloppy, yeah. Let's talk about bands with other. <laughs> Let's talk about Keep it. it together. Keep it together yeah. over there. A variant... On the banding mechanics. So, uh, as as y'all know, Patrick is our uh, our requisite band master. So, take it away, because I don't know how this works. So, it the short is that it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. I don't know if this was just not realized in the playtesting. No, not the playtesting. It's the phone calls. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying, calls. like, so the, the banding rules... When you attack, you're allowed to have one non-bander in the band. Okay, so when I attack, I got a creature here with banding, and I got a creature here without banding, and that can they can team up. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. So bands with others, uh, for example, the cycle of lands that don't produce mana that say your green legends can band with other legends. Mm-hmm. Just because your green legend can band with another legend does not mean that that other legend can band with your green legend. Okay. So yeah. it's a two-way street okay. to be able to band. So it kind of works when you're blocking, but doesn't work when you're attacking unless you have the other one that links it up. Okay. So you need a, your red your red legend needs to have the red one and your green legend needs to have the green one. The lands? Yeah. Okay. For them okay. to be able to band and attack. Okay. Okay. That's a lot. This is really the last hurrah of trying to make banding matter. <laughs> and it's just, it is sort of, it's, it does highlight the problem, which is how do we expand upon this? Mm-hmm. And it turns out that, okay, well, we can make a subset of banding conditions. Uh, okay, that doesn't work. Okay. Literally can't do that. The rules don't support it. Okay. All right, what else is left for the design space? Nothing except making creatures that band, the, the same thing we were doing before. Okay. And uh, the gameplay is not good, and it's too complicated. So perfect. Print it. I think it's I, I think it's the most likely explanation is that the designers making this set, ostensibly the people who understand magic the best at this point. Because remember, we're talking kind of pre-tournament, pre-rules committee kind of stuff. Yep. You would assume these people have the best understanding of the rules, probably did not realize these cards did not work. I buy that. I think that's the most likely scenario. I buy that. So once the designers are designing cards that don't work because they don't understand how the mechanic works. What hope does the average player have of being able to play games that involve it? Sure. So stop doing it. Please stop doing it. And soon after that, they stop. So in my head right now, here's what I imagine, right? I've already talked about the rotary phone calls and everything. Yeah. So this is kind of like banding's last hurrah in some respects, I'd say. Right? They like tried this, didn't really work, right? I imagine like they're in some sort of conference room and they're just like, hey, let's talk about banding. And, and most people are just going like, yeah, you know, like it's just too complicated and I think we just probably got to call it on this. And there's just one person in the, in the conference that's just like, nah, like I think I can fix it. Yeah. And everyone's just going like, but but no. Yeah, and it, it no. even it's even like, it's 
not only is there the uh just because a can ban with b doesn't mean a b can ban with a mm -hmm. there's even if a can ban with c does not mean that b can ban with c sure and everything has to work for you to be able to make the attack with your thing yeah yeah, horrendous it's, it's too much it doesn't work yeah there's five lands in the set that don't make mana and don't work yeah i love that the lands don't make mana there's which we're gonna five get of, to there's five of them yeah that's right because you know we got to fill out the design space right no you don't you don't <laughs> have to do this i promise you you don't have to do this also the legends in these sets are all seven mana four fours what what do you need to ban them for team it up team it up like okay Sorry, it's I like just... what's go it's like what's going on. <laughs> this, this is like what's going on in Martian Machine. Just yeah. Valley and the Gitchrock monster just banding mm -hmm. with one yeah. another. Yeah, but that's, that's yeah, but that's like a card. <laughs> that's just like a card with text on that. That's like maybe a little wordy, but everything explained that's there just, is pretty simple. This is the new age of band with others. That's what yeah. Valley and the Gitchrock monster and these jammed together legends from the new set are. So there you go. They, they they finally fixed it. Uh, poison counters. A player with ten poison, ten or more poison counters loses the game. We all know this from infect and poisonous and toxic. Uh, but this is where it all began with pit scorpion and snake tokens created from. Oh oh man, he's on the Hold spot. On. He's on the spot. It's um. Oh god, this is gonna kill me. Ha it's a legend. Starts with an H. I don't, I don't have it. Uh, the state tokens are created from Serpent Generator. Oh, Serpent Generator. Who am I thinking of? I know what you're thinking of. I'm not going to say it yet, though, because okay. it comes up later. I know what you're thinking of. It's not staying. You're thinking of sand tokens. Sand tokens, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know. I, and I know who makes them. Okay. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, the precursor to Poisonous with cards like Snake Cult in, uh, Initiation and Virulent Sliver. Uh, in fact, with cards like Blister Elf and uh, Blighted Agent and then the Toxic Mechanic from cards like Venerated Rock Beast and, of course, uh, Skrell's Hive. We got Rampage. Mm -hmm. Finally. Yeah, we got there. We've we've organically solved the scourge of quadruple blocking. That's right. We're not, <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about the video game, the movie by The Rock, or uh, the, the secondary show. It's like reverse banding. The secondary show by <laughs> AEW. Is it like that? Yeah, it kinda... uh, An attacking creature gets a bonus to its power and toughness when it's blocked by more than one creature. So uh, I did not know that these stack. Right. So basically what happens is a uh, craw giant, I think is the most useful example of this. I think it has rampage too. Is that uh, right? Uh, Rathy berserker. That was the one that I wanted when I was a kid. Okay. Basically you double block one of these creatures. It gets bigger. If you, it gets a bonus. If you triple block, it gets that bonus again, apparently, which I didn't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's cumulative. So okay. your opponent tries to quadruple block your Rathy berserker. They're in trouble. Okay. So there's really just no stopping these things if they get blocked by multiple things. Right. Okay, cool. So you could just block it with one thing sure. or ignore it or <laughs> sure. kill it. Sure. Uh, Rampage didn't last that long, I don't think. Well, it's a I mean, it's a terrible mechanic. Um, <laughs> so to the extent to the extent it does anything, it's when someone doesn't understand how it works. Okay. Because you would just not block in a way that would allow the Rampage to invalidate the second block okay you'd either just block with your two four fours and the rampage bonus is not enough to do more than just uh killing one of the four fours or uh you just don't know how it works those are sure. really the only outcomes okay rather berserker is a really good example because it was highly desired at the time and it's a five mana two three <laughs> with rampage three and it's just like you know, they just don't have to block that one. <laughs> sure, sure. They really have a, a very simple way of playing around that card, which is just no blocks. I'll take two. Yeah, or block with one. Also like, you fine. just block with a 3-3, three, three, mm -hmm. and it's also dead. Okay. okay. But, uh, you know, Rampage 3, that was a big number. You could have some dreams with lure and effects like that. So it was a pretty popular card at the time in spite of being, like, so bad. Okay. Okay. So bad. Uh, we have some new counters, counter types introduced. So I'm going to play the game where I'm going to name the counter type and you tell me what card it's from. Okay. Now, I don't think you're going to do very well, but you might surprise me. Okay. Okay. And remember, anytime I throw this game at Patrick, he's always on the spot. He doesn't yeah, it's, it's always cold. All right. So carry encounters. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't have it. Osai Vultures. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Dream Counters. Uh, I'll go with Rasputin Dreamweaver. Got it. Okay. All right. Glyph Counters. Uh oh god, one of the horrible glyphs. Uh I think it's the white glyph. I don't know the name though. Alright, I'm gonna give you credit if it is the white glyph. Okay. I don't know if I don't know. Okay, it's the answer is glyph of delusion. Okay. That's not the white one. Okay. The white one is glyph of life. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Hatchling counters. Hatchling counters. Nope. Jurassic egg. Okay. Intervention counters. Uh, divine intervention. Nicely done. You've gotten two of five. Matrix count. Matrix counters. Excuse me. Uh, is it the portal? I don't know. Life matrix. Life matrix. Okay. Pin counters. Pin like P I N. Yes. Like pin back. You're uh. This is a trick question. You're making it up. Voodoo doll. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> all right this one might, <laughs> this one's really hard this, this one might be doable there's only three left poopa counters p-u-p-a <laughs> no clue cocoon, cocoon. <laughs> okay that's right i should have done that yeah one. i was hoping you'd get it kind yeah. of makes sense well the, yeah that's a that's a one of my kids favorite keep the cat books is about a butterfly hatching oh there you go about, yeah there you i should go. have that one cocoon. scream counters scream scream uh all hollow z that's correct all right that's correct okay uh and then one more this is brutal sleep counters sleep sleep oh he said he said it like that F- uh f- fool's gold oh, so it's something gold it's venerian venerian yeah okay. that's right i don't yeah. even know i don't know what that card is it's like blue blue x i think you tap something for x turns or something like that uh blue blue x Enchant creature, put X counters on tap creature. Target creature becomes tap when Venerian Gold is cast. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Okay. You know, that, 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 that was really, a tough game. That was a tough game. That's what that that felt like one of those when people talk about their like college organic chemistry classes where they have to grade on a curve where like a thirty seven percent is an A. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Scared stuff yeah. there. That one that was, was brutal. That one was tough on purpose. Oh. Uh everybody, those are the mechanics of legends we're gonna take a short break when we come back we are diving into the cycles of this fantastic set see you soon all right everybody we are back and it is cycles time here on the receivables legends edition we are gonna dive into a set that has quite a few not a ton (laughs) but enough for us to talk about them Uh, But a couple of quick notes off the jump. Number one, Legends is the first expansion to have cycles. So that's kind of nice. Because it's so big, they have the space to do it. Correct. And then Legends originally had six cycles of cards based on the game of chess, which each color, excuse me, with each color having a similar card for each of the six chess pieces. But then they did away with that. Okay. Okay. So let's talk first about color wash instant. Heaven's Gate. Sea King's Blessing, Touch of Darkness, Dwarven Song, Sylvan Paradise. Each of these uncommon instants has a casting cost of M and the effect of changing the color of any number of target creatures to a particular color until end of turn. Sick. They're still really into this. Are they, they're, they're never good, right? No. Is that, 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 that I mean, never good? There's extreme, I mean, there can be extreme, like, you know, anti-color hoser type of situations but by and large yeah doesn't really do anything okay like i'm all, whenever we get to these color wash type of things i'm always like well maybe those were like good back in the day and then everyone i talked to was like no they weren't good no and they made so many of them yeah they really like did. i said i don't really begrudge doing one as like a thing to think about okay but doing like so many of these they're also not like the most resonant designs yeah like if you do one that's sort of okay this is the color that does it or there's a story here when you do five, it just feels like these are. It's just because there's some rules in a game, and they can talk about the rules a certain way. Sure, it actually makes each of the designs worse doing more of them. Let's get to the glyphs: glyph of life, glyph of delusion, glyph of doom, 
glyph of destruction and glyph of reincarnation. Each of these common instants has a casting cost of M and an effect that interacts with walls. Each of these cards was illustrated by Susan Van Camp. And as we know, as we've gone through this show, walls were a very big deal at the beginning of Magic's history. There's a ton of them. Yeah. And being able to interact with them or get around them or destroy them or what have you was a really big deal. Or give one of your walls plus 10 plus so. What card does that? A glyph of Destruction, I'm pretty sure. I'm checking. It basically Shrapnel blasts your wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's like plus 10 plus 0 and dies in a turn or something like that. Okay, hold on. That's the red one. Glyph of Destruction. Red. Target wall you control. <laughs> Just 10. Just. Yeah. You went. It's like. There's not even any. <laughs> I'm pretty sure at this point there's nothing in Magic that can survive 9. It's like Colossus of Sardia, I'm pretty sure, is the biggest one. Um, but this is really fun, you know, in, in casual vintage, if you have your Rolling Stones deck, you just like oh, 10 ball ten yeah. ball you fling or whatever. Uh, any damage dealt to target wall is reduced to zero. Target wall is destroyed at the end of turn. Nice. Yeah. Well, well done. Well yeah, done. it's really sweet if you can attack with a wall. Okay. But that's sort of, that's the tricky part. Uh, I know these, these, this cycle's your favorite, probably. Anti land walk enchantments. Uh, Great Wall, Undertow, Quagmire, uh, Crevace, and Deadfall. Each of these uncommon enchantments has a casting cost of 2 and M, and an effect that allows creatures with a given land walk ability to be blocked as though they didn't have that ability. Yeah, it's uh, pretty funny, uh, in part because I'm pretty sure at this point there's exactly one creature with planes walk, and it's in the set. Uh, I. There's at least one. I think there might be two. Okay. I can't remember for sure. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for Deadfall. So Deadfall, uh, as as an example, two and a green enchantment. Creatures with Forest Walk may be blocked as if they did not have this ability. Seems like that should be a world enchantment. Yeah. Maybe. Symmetrical, be. like you mentioned. Right. Um, yeah, I wonder how much the play those things got. I'm going to assume not much. No. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's get to the mana batteries. Here we go. Uh, white, blue, black, red, and green mana battery. Each of these uncommon artifacts... Uh, with a casting cost of four, and then the two activated abilities, they had two, tap, put a charge counter on it, and then tap, remove any number of charge counters, and you get a bunch of mana of that particular color. Now, I will say, young Cedric loved a mana battery. Eugene Harvey thrashed me with these things. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Just Armageddon, mana battery, white <laughs> mana battery left over. <laughs> okay. Just build back up. Did you ever beat Eugene ever? I bet, you know, a handful of times. It's actually funny, because... My record against him in Sanction, like Grand Prix and Nationals Pro Tours, I'm like X and O okay. against him. But at this point, no. Yeah. It couldn't come close. He beat me with all the worst cards. <laughs> sure, sure. Sounds like he's putting you in the Nether Void lock. He's getting arm like mana battering you. It's well, just all bad. Yeah, well, it, 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 I mean, on a serious note, it really made me feel like the game was like, like big with a lot of possibilities. Sure. Um, Because Eugene was just thrashing me with cards no one else played with okay and it was cool just to be like oh maybe there is more to this game than just soul ring and stone ring and source of pleasures like there's other stuff that's going on here and yeah eugene eugene beat me with everything so the interesting he had a thing Homerid deck oh okay that's fallen empires right yeah he okay. had a Homerid deck that was nasty okay <laughs> yeah it's just anything so the interesting <laughs> thing about magic now as opposed to magic like way back when right so if we're if we're looking at the game like as we're viewing through the lens of legends and the sets that we've covered, right? It feels very, my goal is to make it so that you can't do anything. Well, that's where all the power level was baked in. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's just like, you know, circle protections, a bit like the hosers that we've talked about ad nauseum, right? It's just like all of these cards that are just like, you don't get to play now is as magic progressed. And we're going to get into like our tournament playing days and stuff. A lot of it was built around like the instance and sorceries. Or like, you know, as you mentioned earlier, to like Tolarian Academy. Like just these busted cards where the games ended very quickly. Nowadays, magic is based around mostly creatures, mm -hmm. right? And planeswalkers and like combat and stuff. And so if you're someone who's been playing magic like a very long time like you and I have, we've kind of gone through the paces of what magic used to be to what magic is now. And I'm not going to speak for you. You can speak for yourself in just a moment. It's much better now. Of, of course. Like, creature combat and like spells come up and stuff, but it's not blow up all your lands or what's in your deck 28 counter spells two creatures and if you look at alpha look at all like look at the keywords it's just you have flying you have trample you have first strike you have and then there's some 
ones maybe a, a step down below, but still speak to this. Regeneration. So many of the creature keywords assume your opponent might block. Sure. A lot of these things don't do anything until your opponent also has a creature. Mm -hmm. When one person has a creature and the creature's in their deck and the other person doesn't, what often happens is the creatures are reduced to what's their power to mana or do they like draw a card when they come to play sure. and that's it yep. and you lose all the sort of tactical sort of dynamicism of well you have a first striking creature which means attacking on the ground is bad with but i have a flying creature which makes it so that your first striking creature can't block but you have this reach creature over there like blah, blah. like that's where our game pieces interact in ways that are I interesting and d different from game to game um, but that doesn't come up until we both have creatures. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, magic, magic way back in the day, it was a boy. It was a real hoot. Uh, speaking of a hoot bands with other lands. Yeah. Let's great. Go, let's go to get through these. Five. Here. Uh, <laughs> Cathedral of Sarah, Seafarers, Quay, Unholy Citadel, Mountain Stronghold, Adventures Guild House. Each of these uncommon lands has no mana ability, but has an ability that grants legendary creatures of a particular color bands with other legendary creatures shout out to uh cathedral of sarah okay the uh first magic card where my oldest child said i really like the artwork on that can i have it yeah you can have it yeah it broke up my cycle i, had, hey. I, had, I did have all five you'll be all right i think you'll be all right toa magic.com <laughs> yeah. we'll to bed that you've got a cathedral of sarah out there we'll talk after uh the video goes up uh legendary lands Caracas, Teleria, Urborg, Hammerheim, and Pendlehaven. Each of these uncommon legendary lands produces one color of mana, has an additional activated ability that targets creatures, and has a flavor text taken from real world poetry. Do you mind bringing up Urborg for me? I'm happy to. I just want to verify my recollection of this card. Okay. What do you think it does? I think it removes Swamp Walk. Uh, Urborg, taps for a black, tap, remove first strike ability or swamp walk ability from target creature until end of turn. It's interesting to do that and also the enchantment that causes things to lose swamp walk. It's a little strange. <laughs> Maybe they could have cut one of those cards from the set. Maybe, <laughs> Maybe they could have cut five of the <laughs> crevasses, the crevices. <laughs> I like calling them crevasses. Past, past the crevasses. There you go. Uh, do you remember Teleria? Uh, during upkeep, remove the banding or bands with other ability from target creature until end of turn. There you go. Thank Some God. of these were a little bit better than. Well, the that others. one is like at least like that's at least making the game more fun. Sure, sure. I have a story about Caracas. Okay. So I was playing in my local card shop, and my opponent had an Italian Caracas, and I've got this Air on the Relentless in my hand. Okay. Five two legend with haste. haste? Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like. If I play this and they know what their Caracas does, I'm in trouble. But my opponent doesn't seem too experienced. I think they probably just think it's a planes. They don't speak Italian. Fancy planes. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it. Okay. Play it. Doesn't get bounced. Win. And Eugene was watching this and he's like, Don't you know what Caracas does? I go, I do. But I thought they didn't know. <laughs> That was right. I, I absolutely know. Error on the Relentless went for a pure 20. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it would have been a commander damage win if we were <laughs> playing, with, playing with those four. Uh, we have flavor text legendary creatures. Angus McKenzie, <laughs> Half Dane, Gwendolyn D. Corsi, yeah. Bartel Runax. Bartel Runax, a dealer. And <laughs> Jacques. Lever. <laughs> Another dealer. All right. All uh, dealers. All right. So first of all, first of all, yeah. as I oftentimes say with cards, I'm not sure how to pronounce. I'm doing the best I can. Right. Okay. Uh, there's your disclaimer. Each of these rare legendary creatures has a casting cost requiring three allied colors and flavor text referring to one of the legendary lands. So there you go. They're all pretty bad. No, Gwendolyn of course he is crack. Is Gwendolyn good? Oh, yeah. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> that, card, uh, that card is crap all right let's take a look here there's a couple legends in the set that are actually busted okay gwendolyn is r it's probably right up here r b b u three five 
tap target player discards one card from his or her hand at random, this this power may only be used during your turn. I mean, it's not that bad. It's like kind of big. You can't kill it, and you it's you get you have a random card discarded every turn. All right, yeah, that's not that bad. card for, is that card's really for good. like ninety. This is ninety four. Yeah, yeah, for ninety four magic, this is actually probably the rest of them not so much. Okay, Gwendolyn de Corsi is cracked. Okay, all right. Uh, let's get to the Elder Dragon Legends, yeah, our last them. cycle. Mm-hmm. Arcady Sabbath, Chromium, Nickel Bolas, Vivectus, Asmati. Yeah. Nice. And Palladia Moors. Each of these rare 7-7 legendary Elder Dragon creatures has flying, a casting cost of 2 M N N N O O. So, mm-hmm. like, white, blue, 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 green, green, and an upkeep cost of one of each of the colors of mana and at least one other ability. This is the first multicolored cycle, the first creature cycle, and the first creatures with multiple creature type cycle, and inspire the creation of multicolored legendary dragons and in invasion, like Rith the Awakener. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here's my history with these. Growing up, I think Chromium was like the coolest card I ever saw. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I want one of those. This thing looks awesome. It's not that good of a card, but. <laughs> no, it's not. But, but, Is that the one with Rampage? Let me check really quick. <laughs> I know it's like the Metal Dragon. Yeah. Uh, Flying Rampage 2. Yeah, it's like. There are a lot who's, of, du- who's a lot of double, double blocking, blocking your 7 7 flyer in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Nickel Balls is actually sick if you hit it. Uh, excuse me i got the casting cost wrong of these dragons it's two and then two of each color so for chromium it's two black two blue two white for arcadia sabbath it's two white two yeah. green you might have been blue. thinking of like the ultimatums or yeah, something. yeah yeah okay so got it fix my little error there but uh nickel Bo- you said nickel bolts was good <laughs> well i mean if you hit once they're dead Did That's it, at they least just, they discard their hand right? yeah it's just yeah it's just mind twist if you hit them okay okay um yeah, and Nicol Bolas is probably the best history of all of these cards because like it's like the most important of the five. They've well, made, yeah, like, it was actually it. like a like a, a really popular card at the time. I mean, all of these were, but Nicol Bolas in particular. Yeah, so these these were popular like oh way back God. in the day because they I mean, they read powerful. Yeah, they were in Chronicles, and the, like everyone put as many of these into their deck as they could get. Okay, even though again they were terrible, and just another creature that. You play it and your opponent's like, okay, cool, Armageddon. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Just another. People didn't learn the lesson for a really long time. <laughs> Don't play. Do not play with cards that cost mana to upkeep because you will not have mana on your turn. Look here. I'm talking directly. This camera? Is it this one? <laughs> Gavin Verhey. I know you guys are trying to fix white. Can I get one set with Armageddon? One, just, just a little two year little taste for everybody that's all i want yeah i i i could be talked into it if you paired it with like 10 to 15 really powerful creatures with upkeep costs of mana let's Cause, go because is armageddon is armageddon not fun i would say yeah reasonable people can disagree okay. but is armageddon away someone's knuckle bowl is very funny yes. yes yes it is and fun and funny those are connected yeah you're right so there you go uh, those are our cycles, everybody, of legends. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, uh, we got to dive into the misprints section of this show, of which there are quite a few. See you back here for that in just a bit. All right, everybody, we are back for the misprints section of our legends episode here on the Receivables. We have. A decent number of these things to talk about. We're going to dive in like the misprint slash like trivia aspect of things now. So let's start off with uh, apparently a card you know far too well and uh, Rathy Berserker. Yeah. I don't know why you know this card so well. Because it was just one of those cards that for some reason spoke to me because it was part of it was it was hard to find. Okay. Um, And... You know, our, our, our mana cost has a certain vibe to it. The art's cool. Just all of it. Well, I don't know if you knew this or not, but it was supposed to be printed with the AE symbol. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not. It's printed incorrectly. It's just Rathy Berserker, lowercase r. Um, the font used for card names does not include the AE character. 
I'll say this, okay? Hard to find out how bad a card is if you can never cast it. That's true. And if you've got a two-color deck like I did, and the card's triple red, it's just in your hand a lot. It's a 2-4. Oh, 2-4. Yeah, you thought it was a 2-3. It's 2-4. Really? Yeah. I have This is a like a Bernstein Barrett moment. I'm sorry. My, my recollection is so strong that this thing was a 2-3. 2-4, Rampage 3. Well, definitely good luck double blocking that. <laughs> Just take the two. That's all. <laughs> just take just take two. Uh, Bloodlust, a card I used to love. The ability text should read target creature gains, not target creature gain. So uh, it should have an S. This error was corrected apparently in fourth edition. Uh, Bloodlust, for those of you not in the know, a target creature gets plus four, minus four until end of turn. Um, if this reduces creature's toughness below one, creature's toughness is one. Yeah, uh, this card was... Very common in my, again, early quote-unquote tournament experience. Good with the following cards. Ball Lightning. Yep. Elvish Archers. Yep. Berserk. Yep. And that's basically a deck. Yeah, it's a, just deck all by itself. That's already a deck. Okay. Uh, gaseous Form. The word creature is misspelled C-R-E-A-U-R-E. -E. So no just P. not even close? Creer. <laughs> <laughs> in the first line of the ability text <laughs> confirming this is great i i love when these things happen career almost yep there yeah, it is there it is it's on the screen too i'm sure uh so a little boo-boo there infinite authority the word creature is misspelled again this Ooh. time <laughs> this time c-r-e-a-e-t-u-r-e -E Creator. Okay. Uh, in the fifth line of the ability text, what color do you think Infinite Authority is? That sounds like a white card. White. I would guess white. All right, let's check. It's near Ivory. Okay, Infinite Authority. Oh god, these oh. cards are so brutal to read. Oh yeah, it's horribly misspelled. <laughs> wow. Nobody rocking the spell check back in '94. Uh, and then Psionic Entity. The illustration was by Justin Hampton not Susan Van Camp. This error was corrected in fourth edition. So there you go. That's the easy part. Uh, let's talk about a couple of functional reprints here while we're in this section of the show. Uh, Barbary Apes. Which Grizzly you mentioned. Bears. That's correct. Oh, wait, you want to play? You, oh, you want to battle? Oh, yeah. oh, you want to battle? Okay. Okay. Uh, Headless Horseman. Skate Zombies. Correct. Raging Bull. Ray Ogre. Correct. Walking Dead. Drudge Skeletons. He's four for four. Crushed it. That was, Crushed it. That was easy. All right. Ding, 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 all the way around. Culture, culturally insensitive cards. <laughs> well, got to mention them. It's part of the job of the show. Yep. Uh, cleanse, invoke prejudice, imprison, and pradish gypsies. If you go into Scryfall or Gathor or anything like that, gone. Mm -hmm. Disavowed. Yeah, probably for the best. Uh, the following creature types are introduced in Legends. So we'll uh, we'll dive into these real quick. Um, I'm going to make this quicker. I don't know if you want to play this game. Oh, the, oh, okay. I named the creature type. You named the card. Yes. With the caveat. Okay. That if I want to tap out, we, we, we tap out. Okay, fine. Bat. Vampire bat. One for one. Beast. This is the first set with a beast. So I've been told. Uh, I don't know. It's red. Uh, I don't know. Beast of Bogarden. Okay. Would not, I did not know that was a card. Berserker. Wrathy Berserker. There you go. Two, four. Boar. Dirk of Boars. Okay. All right. Drake. Uh, Azure Drake? Yes. Oh, he's getting a little, he's getting a, he's getting a little, he something, know, he a little something cooking. Gnome. Uh, don't know. Quorum and Trench Gnomes? <laughs> don't, don't even know what that card probably is. Probably takes away a land walk from something. Hag. Bog Hag? Brine Hag. Brine Hag. Horror. Uh, Abomination? Incorrect. It is a black Cosmic card. Cosmic Horror? Yes. Okay. The black card. Uh, her, her, Kithkin. Emeru Kithkin. That's correct. Uh, Cobalt. The Cobalt of Care Keep and others. There's also Crookshank it, and, and Crimson. And Crimson, correct. Manticore. Crimson Manticore. Oh, you're doing pretty good, actually. Night Stalker. Oh, um... Vampiric Night Stalker. Shimian Night Stalker. Shimian, yeah. Ooze. 
Uh oh, man. Red card. Yeah. Uh, I I know the art. I don't know the name. Primordial ooze. Primordial ooze. Yep. Phoenix. Uh. Wow. What was the phoenix in the set? I don't remember. Firestorm Phoenix. Oh, that's right. Uh, Seder. Uh, don't know. Willow Seder. Not many left. Scorpion. Good Scorpion. Okay. Slug. Uh, a, a, is it a six slug? A giant slug. Giant slug. Uh, spawn. Um, spawn of mayhem? No. Jeez. <laughs> it's going off the rails. Elder Spawn. Oh, Elder Spawn. Yeah. Uh, Spirit. It is a white creature. Uh, I don't know. Yes, you do. Oh, thunder spirit. There you go. Turtle. Uh, giant, uh, yep. Giant turtle. There, yeah. uh, no, giant turtle. Giant turtle. There's giant turtle. Oh. <laughs> wombat. Rabid wombat. There he is. He's back. Uh, and Yeti. What? I don't know. Mountain Yeti. Yeah, I don't know. Come on. This, this said so the big. The picture is just iconic. I think it's like it's four. I think, it, I think it's four mana, three, three mountain walk. I'm actually going to the tape here on Scryfall. I'm almost positive that's what Mountain Yeti is. Where you at? Yeah. And protection from white for reasons, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I remember that card because it's got the shadow in the background of right. like the Yeti in the snow. That's all. I did okay there. Better than I expected. Yeah. Uh, those are the misprints. Now, normally we would group the misprints together with the trivia, but uh, spoiler alert, there's a lot of trivia to get to. So we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to go through all of the trivia. So if you're a trivia fan on this show, we've got quite a bit for you. See you in a sec. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Legends episode here on the Receivables, and it is now time to dive in the into the excuse me very lengthy trivia portion of the show. <sighs> I hope you're ready. Mm -hmm. We got a lot here. Uh, here's some just some general trivia. Despite the set's large size, Legends contains no basic lands and thus is not considered to be a standalone expansion. You knew that. Mm -hmm. The legendary super type replaced Legend creature type when the Legend rule was. Updated in 2004 with the introduction of Kamigawa Block. I knew it. I knew that's when the legend rule changed. Nice. Okay, it had to do with like Jite and stuff. Originally, the restricted list included every legendary creature type for flavor reasons. <laughs> mm -hmm. They were removed with the release of, of, of the Ice Age expansion in 95. Yeah. So it didn't last very long. All the multicolored cards in the legends are legendary creatures, and all the legendary creatures are gold creatures. Which makes some sense. Uh, no creatures are printed with the bands with other abilities. <laughs> That's what the lands are for. They didn't have a lot of confidence in that ability, I would say. Uh, well, well, they had enough confidence to print at least five cards. <laughs> sure, but, sure. but yeah. Uh, Master of the Hunt can produce creatures with the ability, and the lands of the bands with other land cycle detailed above give uh, give legendary creatures this ability. Detailed a little earlier in the show. Uh, Rampage was originally called Berserk, mm -hmm. but it was changed because a card already used that name called Berserk. And Berserk would be good with Berserk. Yes. Yes, yeah. it, it would be. Uh, an early version of Rampage allowed a creature to attack some additional number of times in a turn, with creatures only able to block the first attack. <laughs> Probably would have been too good. Well, uh, that's at least fun. Sure. Uh, like, I, I grant that that could be hard to balance and there could be externalities on that. That mechanic is at least, like, fun and useful. Uh, the mechanic was designed to be used in future sets, but unfortunately, due to the Beyond the First Clause, keyworded Rampage was phased out in favor of a similar ability without the drawback. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Uh, Poison was the first alternative win condition introduced uh, aside from decking via, of course, Millstone. Range Strike, or the ability, or the activated ability to deal damage to an attacking or blocking creature, was first introduced in Legends. Can you name the creatures that have that ability? There are two. That deal damage to things that are attacking or blocking? Correct. Mm. Don't know. Deaviant Archer. Right. And Crimson Manticore. Yep. There you go. The Kobolds are 0-1 red creatures with a casting cost of 0 and are the only functional identical cards ever printed in the same expansion. Yep. 
Uh, Crimson Cobalts, Crookshank Cobalts, and Cobalts of Care Keep are the cards in question. Legends contains 11 walls and 10 cards that reference walls, which is more cards in each category than any other set. <laughs> Magic really, really liked walls. I don't know if they liked walls more or less than hosers. Might be a tie. It's also like kind of weird to do in a set that's all about epic characters and legends. storytelling and legends. I like the idea of like a legendary creature just coming up to a wall and just being like, can't do it. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Just, sorry. I'm beat. Yep. My, my hero's <laughs> journey has ended. <laughs> I have encountered a uh, wall of stone. <laughs> it is impervious to anything that I do. I guess I'm going home. <laughs> and that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. Uh, 20 of the legendary creatures in Legends were reimagined with a contemporary perspective in the 2022 Dominari United Lost Legends. Uh, I've got a longer note here. Let's see. In selected collector boosters. An original card from Legends found in an old warehouse was included. These Lost Legends appear in 3% of boosters, and not every card from Legends was included. Some cards were missing because of the well-known Legends uh, collation problems, some because Watsy doesn't want to be associated with a certain artist anymore, and some because the depictions or flavor text are nowadays considered to be culturally offensive. They're making changes. That's a good thing. Because original cards are used, their distribution doesn't violate the reserve list. Great. Are you ready to get to the white aspect of things? Sure. All right, here we go. Clergy of the Holy Nimbus is the first white creature with regeneration. Divine Intervention is one of only two cards ever printed intended to cost the game to end in a draw. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this set comes out. So this set comes out, and the number of unique designs in Magic is about 800. Okay. Two of them mm -hmm. are this and Shaharazad. Mm -hmm. That's right. Two. That's right. That's right. These that's people... so. That's so much of the total number of cards to do this twice. You can't stop these people. No, you can't. Uh, it was banned from sanctioned play. Was divine intervention uh, for a period of years because the DCI wanted to discourage games from ending in a draw. Good job, DCI. Uh, <laughs> it inspired the creation of Celestial Convergence, the other game drawing card, which otherwise would end in a win for the highest life total. Uh, Divine Offering was originally to be named Divine Sacrifice, but it was changed when the term sacrifice was given rule significance because of the sacrificing of creatures and things. Really good policy here. Um, don't call two different things the same word Agreed. if you can avoid it. Agreed. Just comes up, creates problems. Divine Transformation was designed to have a dramatic effect on the creature it enchants by giving it the largest single power and toughness boost without a drawback. It inspired the embrace cycle of Auras and Urza's Saga. Yeah. So that's like Guy's Embrace, Shiv... Oh, wait, I'm going to see if I can do this. Guy's Embrace, Shivan's Embrace. Uh, I don't think there was a blue one. There was. No, Zephyr's Embrace, right? Um, was there a black one? Yeah. Is it Sinir's Embrace? Yeah, I forget. Okay. And then what other color is there? I don't know. Gaia, Sarah... Zephyr, Shiv, and the black one. Okay. It's probably right here. I don't know what it is. Whatever. I'm going to keep it moving. Irrelevant. Uh, Moat, was, Moat was originally called Chasm in playtesting. It had a uh, casting cost of four and a white, so five mana. And, quote, only flying creatures can damage the caster. That's what it originally was going to be. Okay. Uh, it inspired the creation of Teferi's Moat. Petra Sphinx. I used to love this card when I was a kid. Uh, is the first card to ask a player to name a card. And rewarded players for having large amounts of information about the game and inspired the creation of Scrying Glass. Isn't Nebuchadnezzar also in the set? Mm, that's a gold card? Yeah, I thought Nebuchadnezzar also did something with like naming cards. Let's take a look, Ski. Uh, three blue, black, blue. It's probably over my shoulder. Uh, X, tap, name a card. Opponent reveals X cards from his or her hand at random or entire hand if he or she does not have enough cards. Opponent that discards any of those names cards that match the one you named. Well done. Okay. Look at you poking a mm. hole in the facts here. Cool. In the trivia. Uh, Presence of the Master depicts Albert Einstein and is one of only a few cards that depicts a real world figure in its art. Mm -hmm. Modern cards purposely avoid real world name symbols, events, and figures, I'm sure, for copyright and trademark and all that jazz. Righteous Avengers is the first of only a handful of creatures with Planeswalk. Uh, the rarest of the basic landwalk abilities. Ironically, two cards, Great Wall and Lord Magnus, were also printed in Legends with the ability to negate the Planeswalk ability. Yeah. Gotta shut it down. Gotta make sure 
there's one it's a three one for five if memory serves and there's two cards that just shut it down can't have it can't have it uh there's a card in the set get crevassed <laughs> seeker uh which is a card i remember was originally designed to make the creature it enchanted completely unblockable. What was later changed to mere fear, except for it costs much more, cost mm-hmm. four. Uh, Spirit Link depicts a character which was later chosen to be a reference for Joreal, Empress of Beast, a character that played a big part in Mirage and was made into a card in Prophecy. Thunder Spirit, if you were uh, with us uh, in a earlier episode, we couldn't figure out Thunder uh, Thunder Totem. That's right. I remember that. It's based off of Thunder Spirit. Uh, likely would have been reprinted at some point if it hadn't been added to the reserve list on the merits of being a rare card from an early expansion. It inspired the creation of Sky Spirit to serve as its reprint. Thunder Spirit is on the reserve list. So I was uh, talking with someone who currently works on Magic. We were talking about a bunch of different things, and the reserve list came up. Okay. And, you know, we were talking, you know, like it doesn't reflect well on the game that Volcanic Islands, you know, like $500 and Steam Vents is 10 bucks and just that kind of stinks you know and this designer said yeah so i have uh my reserve list regrets is the top is 11 okay. cards okay all 10 dual lands and then thunder spirit because i would just like to put that thing at uncommon in draft to fill out a set <laughs> sure you can't, can't do it can't do can't it, do it. <laughs> yep. just can't do it uh let's go to blue okay acid rain was pr- uh was printed to mirror tsunami Mm-hmm. Uh, it's considered a bad blue card by Mark Rosewater because it gives access to land destruction, something it shouldn't have access, something blue should have access to. I agree. Uh, Anti Magic Aura and Spectral Cloak are the first cards to have some form of untargetability. These types of cards have inspired many cards, including Mystic Veil, A Robe of Mirrors, Abshan's Desire, so on and so forth. Brian Hag was simply called Hag in playtesting and was a 3 3 with a cost of three and a blue. And, uh, quote, any creature who kills the hag is reduced to a 1-1. One, one. <laughs> uh, enchantment alteration inspired the creation of Auragraft. Field of Dreams was called Reverse Gravity in playtesting and caused players to turn their libraries upside down and draw the card that's showing and had a cost of three and a white. It inspired the creation of Think Tank, which is, I think, a card where you go to the bottom of the deck? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the blue cards here are very strange. And the Eye of Chaos inspired the creation of Ice Cave. Land Equilibrium inspired the creation of Territorial Dispute. Mana Drain, I like this one, is a card that Mark Rosewater famously said every member of R&D would have to be hit by a bus before they would reprint it. Because it's not on the reserve list. Mm -hmm. So it was speculated it could come back in standard at some point. Yeah, no. And even these people who love nothing more than Mana Drain each other Think it's not correct to put Mana Drain into standard. Might win an award or two mm-hmm. in the award show that's coming up soon. Psychic Purge is the first card to punish an opponent for causing discard and inspired the creation of Gorilla Tactics. Puppet Master inspired the creation of Disappear. Recall was added to the restricted list in September 1994 because it allowed the recycling of other powerful cards on the restricted list. It was later removed from this list in April 2003 due to a lack of competitive use. <laughs> thanks to better ways to perform its effect. Yeah, because it sucks. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's really weak. That's why it got removed. Uh, Relic Bind was originally worded to allow it to enchant any artifact, creating a two-card instant win combo with Basalt Monolith at the time. Relic Bind was quickly corrected to allow it to only enchant an opponent's artifact. Smart. Uh, Time Elemental inspired the creation of Temporal Adept. Venerian Gold inspired the creation of Sleeping Potion. Wall of Wonder follows in the footsteps of Black Vice, the Rack, and Cursed Rack. All of these cards are illustrated by Richard Thomas and include the Tortured Doll in the art. Zephyr Falcon and its functional reprint Bay Falcon were the only real mono blue creatures with Vigilance until Planar Chaos introduced Vigilance as a blue ability as part of its color shifting theme via Synchronous Sliver and Sarah Sphinx. There you go. We're teaching you all sorts of things. We're diving into black now. All Hallows Eve. Its card type was subject to errata twice. First, it was made an enchantment, since it remains in play for two turns. Later, it was changed back to sorcery again, with the unique oracle text it has now. Exile All Hallows Eve with two scream counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, if All Hallows Eve is exiled with a scream counter on it, remove a scream counter from it. If there are no more scream counters on it, put it into your graveyard, and each player returns all creatures from their graveyard to the battlefield. This thing is a mess. Yeah. 
Uh, this thing is a mess. This is a really good example of if you're just sort of playing with your friends and you're not being super strict about tournament rules or uh, the, the, the things that really underpin Magic's rules, it plays pretty cleanly for the most part. Okay. It's basically a suspend card. And then, but once you start uh, like needing to adjudicate these things in a tournament setting, it just doesn't work. I like that it was a rat twice. Yeah. And not just that, but it's like, it's an enchantment now. It's back to being a sorcerer. <laughs> We're not sure. Hopefully yeah. this doesn't see any play. Uh, Cyclopean Money, mon- Money, Cyclopean Mummy <laughs> wasn't reprinted in 5th edition because a customer survey uh, after 4th edition showed it to be the most hated card in the set. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's, well, there's a good reason because it's like what's fun about magic is your draw step. Mm-hmm. Cyclopean Mummy for the time is actually not a weak card. The idea, it's like definitely not that the, it's probably in the top. 10 of black cards in the set on power level. Just a 2-1 for 2? Yeah, okay. the drawback. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mostly a drawback. When it dies, remove it from the game. Yeah. Yeah, people didn't like that drawback. No. They said, uh, get this out of here. So they, so they did. Uh, let's see. Giant Slug was was originally called Slug Bug, then Smeltonian Slug, and lastly Slaughter Slug, before achieving its final name. Cool. Greed introduced the idea black should be able to exchange life for cards. It inspired Necropotence and Phyrexian Arena. And uh, Yawgmoth's Bargain. Yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. Those are going to come up in this show's history. Uh, Hell's Caretaker inspired the creation of cards like Shallow Grave, Corpse Dance, and Recurring Nightmare. Siphon Soul is the first card to reference multiple other players, acknowledging multiplayer uh, play for the first time. Uh, your Boy, Tackle Maggot, mm-hmm. uh, inspired the creation of Screams from Within. <laughs> Transmutation. It's really bothersome to think that anyone was desi- like inspired by tackle maga <laughs> sure. like looked at tackle maga and was like I- that gives me an idea <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. uh transmutation inspired many cards including dwarven uh Threg- Thregmon. i don't even not say that word. thaumaturgist that that one and about face thank you uh underworld dreams was once restricted in vintage because of interaction with Time Twister and Wheel of Fortune i was there for that yeah yeah so i know that was a real thing yeah it was a real thing you also just like Again, the pace of play, you couldn't attack with creatures. Things like that were actual. It's it, it's a lot like Black Vice of, this looks so modest, how could have this been strong? Yeah. One, it was a little overrated for sure, okay. but the game was just balanced around different stuff back then. Uh, it has since been reprinted many times. Yeah. And it's not good. In competitive play. I don't know about Commander, casual stuff, whatever. I don't know. I know a, I know a Legends copy of Underworld Dreams is quite expensive, so must have a Commander audience. Okay. Uh, we're going to red cards. Beastable Garden was the only beast until Tempest. Falling Star is one of only a few cards found on the vintage ban list for being a dexterity card or a card that requires some physical skill to use. Okay. Uh, Firestorm Phoenix inspired the creation of Squee, Goblin Nebob. Glyph of Destruction, which you knew right away, uh, influenced the ability of Goblin Bomb, causing it to deal 20 damage instead of simply winning the game. Mm. Uh, Mark Rosewater argued that magic needs more double-digit numbers on cards. Okay. Sure. Uh, Land's Edge inspired the creation of Signs of Basalt. Pyrotechnics inspired the creation of many cards, including Rolling Thunder. Quorum Trench Gnomes has been the only non-artifact gnome for a while. And Raging Bull is the only common red creature in Legends with a power greater than zero. <laughs> because of the Kobolds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Legends rough. Limited is rough. Yeah, it's not easy to attack. Uh, green. Arborea is the only uncommon world enchantment in Legends. It inspired the card Impatience because Arborea uh, rewards players for doing nothing while Impatience punishes players for doing nothing. This is another design. Uh, th- this is on the list of worst magic designs ever. Okay, so... Again, you, another another one. Is, it makes me really nervous to, to hear a designer be like, I was inspired by Arborea. Uh, Arborea 2 uh, <laughs> GG. It's up here, I'm sure. If a player does not cast a spell or put a card into play on his or her turn, no creatures may attack that player until after his or her next turn. Yeah, so if I don't do anything, you can't attack. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, sure, sure. That's great. Let's just look at Mill... I'll, I'll activate Millstone. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Fun. Yeah, that's really fun. Uh, Avoid Fate was improved when interrupts were changed to instance, uh, instance, giving it more potential, yet still very narrow uses. Cat Warriors was the uh, has the first creature type Cat Warrior, which was originally considered to be one type, not two, resulting in being neither a cat nor a warrior. Nicely done. Cocoon inspired the creation of Consuming Ferocity. 
Concord and Crossroads is the first card with true haste, inspired by the creation of Fervor, Fires of Maya, and Mass Hysteria. Eureka is one of only a few cards to depict a real-world object. In this case, Albert Einstein's famous theory of relativity equation M equals, excuse me, E equals MC squared. Uh, it partially inspired the creation of Dream Halls, apparently. Florial, fl Florial Spasm uh, was called Rat King in playtesting and had, if not blocked, the rat may chomp and destroy an artifact, no damage to opponent. I'm seeing, to back up a minute here, I'm yes, seeing please. like the this inspired the design of mm -hmm. and uh, to go back to the antiquities episode of the uh mistress war machine massacre thing <laughs> it's just like there's this there's this really <laughs> recurring pattern of oh uh this design that just this random card no one's ever thought of mm -hmm. what if we just made a completely cracked version of it sure that's just all the like greed that's, like, that's just a random card just whatever it's a thing you can do and it's like oh i got an idea necropotence inspired by this except it's you it's there's no gate on it at all it's bad and it read. costs half the life yeah it's like it's not really inspired by it at that point <laughs> anyhow i'm sorry Continue. you're fine no need yeah, to okay. apologize no need to apologize uh master of the hunt is the first card to allow more than one token creature to be created in a single turn uh with mana as the only cost Rabid Wombat, which was a banger, oh, yeah, sir. Uh, inspired the creation of other creatures that gained a bonus when enchanted, like Fledgling Osprey, uh, Rain Academy Chancellor, and Thran Gullum. Rebirth was the first card with the number 20 in its ability. Stormseeker inspired the creation of Sudden Impact. Stormseeker is one of my favorite cards when I was growing up. Oh, that's another funny inspired the creation of. Mm -hmm. It's the same card. Yes. <laughs> inspired. Yeah, the, yeah, I got an idea. <laughs> so, it's red now. <laughs> so, Sylvan Library inspired the creation of Rowan, Miri's Guide, and Abundance. Whirling Dervish was inspired by the ability of the Pawn card from the original Chess Cycle that didn't make it into the set. Winter Blast is the only green card in the game that can tap multiple opposing creatures outside of combat, whether they have flying or not. And Wood Elemental is often cited as one of the weakest cards ever created. It's quite bad. It's it's not a good card. Yeah. It's not a good card. Uh, I am going to go to the uh, colorless cards very quickly here. Alcor's Tomb was originally designed as Alcor's Tome, but somewhere along the line it was misspelled as Tomb. The error was not discovered until after the art of a tomb was commissioned. And Alcor was the name of Peter Atkinson's main D and D character, and this card was designed by Steve Conrad to play to pay homage to Atkinson. There you go, a little fun fact. Arena of the Ancients, like the other expansion hosing cards in the City in a Bottle and Golgarthian Silex, was created as a way to hose legendary creatures in case they proved to be too powerful. Yeah, if just in case Caracas wasn't enough. <laughs> Got this <laughs> too. Just in case permanent unsummon on a plane <laughs> still was not enough to keep these eight mana crawl worms in check. We had another <laughs> land ready to go. Um, <laughs> mirror universe uh introduced exchange of life totals until the sixth edition rules update a player only lost the game at the end of a phase allowing a player to reach zero life during his or her upkeep um and using mirror universe killing the opponent which mm -hmm. that was a thing back then Teleria is regarded as the weakest of the legendary lands in its set but many events in, in the stories of magic take place in Teleria. And then Jurassic Egg was to be named Jurassic Egg until the release of the movie Jurassic Park. Uh, it inspired the creation of Celestial Convergence, and it likely inspired the creation of Summoner's Egg. Now, here's one of my favorite things about that one. Um, whenever I'm going through this stuff and it's like it is inspired by or everything else, it's just like I'm doing this. I'm like I'm like really diving into the Internet, like I'm like I like clicking like the reference articles, reading everything. And it's just like. Some of these things might be true. They might not be true. Yeah. I can't say for sure. It's just like, really? You were just going to go with Jurassic and the movie came out and you're like, we're out of here. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, multicolor. This is the last one. Uh, is it Dakon or Dakin Blackblade? Well, I, it was known in my neck of the woods as Dakin Blackblade. Okay. I'm going to go with Dakin Blackblade. Inspired the creation of Molimo, Maro Sorcerer, and had a comic written to tell uh, his story by Armada in 1995. Gwendolyn D. Corsi? Uh, Gwendolyn Corsi's model was Mr. Wendy of Seattle punk band Sick and Wrong. Cool. There you go. Uh, the cat to the right was Georgie Tirebiter, the feline inspiration for their song of the same name. Hazion 
Tamar. Oh, you? this is the sand. This is the sand guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here you go. See, you're 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 on it. Is notable for its ability to create sand warrior creature tokens, making sand a creature type. This oddity inspired Dune Brood Nephilim. Nephilim, excuse me, <laughs> to produce sand creature tokens. One of my favorite things about this little factoid is that I look I. I I looked this up because we used to play the game and covers named that Nephilim, mm -hmm. right? So I went to Hazion, and he does, let me make sure because I have it up here and probably there, he does create sand warriors, which makes sense, okay? And the Nephilim does create sand tokens. What is a sand token? And how can it fight? It's just I know, just it's a weird, I, I know. The Nephilim doesn't make a thing that can attack people. It's just like, here's some sand. Good luck. Yeah. It's also weird because sand is one of those, like, what does a unit of sand mean? Yes. Like, one, is it one, or is it like a stack? At least when you call it a sand warrior, it's like, okay, it's like a, a you know, a humanoid size, whatever. I'm Googling yeah, sand. Yeah, sand is not a good token to make. I'm Googling sand creature token right now because I, I had to imagine they made some. Yeah, there it is. Just sand. I'm just going to make some sand. It's your yeah. turn. I'm working, I'm starting to work on my first commander deck, and I'm trying to pick a theme, and this might move me towards sand. Uh, Jacques Levert was inspired by the ability of the Rook card from the original chess cycle. They didn't make it into the set. Jedit? Ojani? Ojanin. Ojani, whatever. Had two comics written to tell his story by Armada in 1995. The Lady of the Mountain. <laughs> That's really funny that Jajet Ojani got, their, the, that card got its uh, two comics. Yeah. Are you familiar with the card? Uh, I'm familiar with it not being good. It's just another crawl worm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> no powers, no rate. Let's see. Four blue, white, white, five, five with a story to tell. Yeah. It's there a seven know. mana, five, five. Mm -hmm. uh, two you, books. You I remember, again, I cannot emphasize this enough at the time that Sarah Angel was already a card. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and these legends are just so... That's why the arena of the engines, like just in case, just in case we missed. Sure. It's like which which one of these could you have conceivably missed with? And they just had to keep making more and more. Just had to keep pumping more cards in this set too. Yeah. Uh, the Lady of the Mountain was inspired by one of Steam, Steve Conrad's Dungeons and Dragons characters, Livonia Silone. Silone is the first of two creatures to have legendary land walk. Um, let's see what else I got here. Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar is the only legendary creature to survive with a real world name. Uh, others, including Hiawatha, Gilgamesh, Beowulf, Lancelot, uh, Serke, Achilles, and Jason were renamed. Uh, and then Nebuchadnezzar inspired the creation of Cabal Therapy. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, Ramirez Di Pietro, I think that's correct, was named after a Dungeons and Dragons character in a campaign belonging to designer Robin Herbert. Ramsey's Overdark, inspired by Robin Herbert, D&D character. Rubinia Soulsinger, orig was originally called Titania, but that name was already used in Antiquities. That and other creatures with the ability to tap to gain control of others inspired the creation of many cards, including Coffin King, Coffin Queen, excuse me. Stang inspired the creation of Gemini Engine. Stang was one of my favorite cards ever when I was growing Stang's up. Stang's dealer. And then Tetsuo Umazawa is the first creature card with the inability to be enchanted. <laughs> <sighs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is your trivia. Wow. For legends. Now we're going to take a break because that was a lot, especially for our editor who's probably just in pure hell right now. So we're going to take a short break and we do come back. It's the award show for legends. See you in a bit. All right, everybody. Let's get that energy level back up. Trivia is done. Award show time here for legends is on the way. We're going to start things like we always do with the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for the best card in legends. We're starting with you. I'm going to give it to Mana Drain. That's a good choice. Yeah. That's a good choice. Yeah. Uh, I'm also going to give it to Mana Drain because it is far and away the most powerful card in the set. And it was even powerful even with uh, Mana Burn. 
Yeah, it's uh, it, even when it was bounced around Mana Burn. Mm-hmm. For those of you who are newer to the game, I was gonna say, how many people do you think watching don't know what Mana Burn is? Like percentage, fifteen, ten to fifteen. Okay, if you had extra mana in your pool at the end of each phase, you would take damage uh for each mana. So there are some cards from that time that make a lot of mana. And theoretically, there's a drawback of, well, if you don't have anything to do with it, then you're going to be taking a bunch of damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, mana drain is theoretically balanced around that, but that's not the case anymore and really wasn't the case at the time anyway. Sure. It wasn't like, oh, no, I'm going to cut mana drain because I keep getting mana burn. <laughs> what am I going to do with this mana? Yeah, what am I going to do with this mana? Uh, yeah, the card's absolutely cracked. It's just banned in Legacy on rate. There's not a whole lot of cards that are... You know, most of the cards that are banned in Legacy are because of combo applications. Yes. And not just raw rate. So I'm comfortable giving it to Mana Drain. Okay. Uh, Carnival of Souls Award time for the worst card in the set. And I'm going to go with Wood Elemental, uh, which is oftentimes cited as one of Magic's worst cards of all time. Uh, It's just really... Look, I'll say this. It's got some fun artwork, at least. It does have some fun artwork. Uh, my vote goes to uh, Lady Orca, okay. and it's tied with a million other. Jigetto Johnny, Tobias Android, uh, Marhal Els Dragon, uh, just a million different. Um, uh, Riven, Tur- um, who was the Riven Turnbull? I like that we don't is even it, know. Is it, is it, it is Riven Turnbull. The seven mana, mana the taps for a black. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> this ability is, this, uh, to be clear, this ability just plays an interrupt. Right. Just so that you There's know. just so what elemental I I guess in most circumstances is weaker than these cards. Okay. But at least what elemental is a thing to think about. You could try to build some sort of deck that's like, oh well I just you know, I do I play wood elemental and then I balance and it's sort of like an Armageddon you know <laughs> sure. whatever. It's at least it's at least inspires some creative juices, even if the card is really, really bad. Okay. A lot of these cards are just so much weaker than the commons in alpha that are one color. <laughs> sure. sure. They're just, it's an outrageous collection of, of cards. There are some legends in here that are reasonably strong that sort of hold up to modern sensibilities. Okay. But a lot of these at the time were just so putrid. This is the first time I've read Lady Orca. This is not a good magic card. Yeah. This is not a good card. What, what percentage of the legends in legends would you play in sealed deck in 2023? Ooh, boy. Yeah, it's like very, it's a very Ooh, short list. That is a tough question. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's 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 brutal. But yeah, I'll, so I'll give it to Lady Orca, acknowledging that, yes, Wood Elemental is probably the weaker card, but at least there's something to consider, whereas these are just like, what is the point? Even setting aside that Caracas, again, is a card. Uh, yes, it is. It's just yes, it this is. legend, the characteristic legend, is barely positively referenced on any cards in the set. And Caracas is there to just put Lady Orga back in your hand. Uh, best, uh, excuse me, Doomblade Award for best non-rare in the set. Uh, you have Caracas there. Yeah, I'm, I am I don't want to double book Mana Drain here because okay. it's the best card and also the best non-rare. Yeah. So I'm trying to mix it up a little bit. Give it to Caracas, super powerful, whatever. Yeah, uh, what he did is not what I'm going to do. <laughs> Mandarin's a, yeah. yeah. It's not a rare. Why isn't it a rare? Oh. Mandarin. Oh, I you love, did it. You I did. mean, I get why it's not a rare, but I also think it's really funny that it's not a rare. It's really funny. Yeah, it's just Got to make sure people get their hands on four of those. Well, it depends on what, um, what, what side yeah, of the yeah. common box they got. Yeah. Yeah, when they're buying boosties. Uh, a Poro, a Boro, Palace in the Clouds Award for fun of one of in the set for me. It is the Tabernacle at Pendril Vale, oftentimes a one of in Lands and Legacy, though uh, it did start to increase in numbers over time. However, its price makes it very difficult to play multiple copies of the card. So I will deem it a fun of one of um, in Lands and Legacy and therefore the winner of the award for me. For you, uh, you have All Hallows Eve. Okay. Not really that good. But a fun and dramatic card when it shows up randomly in games, you know, obviously it's not a part of the competitive scene in any any real way, whatever. But as a card that's like, yeah, it's just fun when someone has a copy of this in their deck. Super fun. Uh, we're going to move on to the Mystic Confluence Award for Best Vintage Cube Card in this set. <laughs> Your choice is my second one. Yeah. Yeah, you've got Caracas here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't pass that card very often. Karaka, again, it's the one two of Karaka's mana drain. Mm-hmm. I put a premium on cards with really, really low opportunity costs. Yep. I think that mana drain is a perfectly acceptable answer. It is cracked. Yep. Uh, but if I had to pick, like, pick one, pack one between those two cards, I would probably take Karakas most of the time. Um, I love drafting white, obviously, mm-hmm. and Karakas can go in any deck, you know, but I am selecting mana drain here. Uh, because I do draft blue occasionally in Vintage Cube, and uh, it's very it's good. Nice. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, good. it's a nice card. Uh, the Smothering Tithe Award for Best Commander Card in the set. As uh, everyone knows, we are Commander Aficionados. Love it. It's our favorite format by far. Uh, and so we have the same answer because we love it so much. Caracas. Wrong. <laughs> I know it's ba- I know it's banned. <laughs> I just wanted to get a little, I wanted to get a reaction. Yeah, Caracas seems really good against people just casting their commander. Why? Just put it back in. Why? Where does it even go? Does it go to their hand? Does it go into the command zone? Yeah. We don't know. Why don't people play Caracas? Yeah. You guys, like, there's casual, and then there's, like, that casual, where you're not even playing Caracas in your commander deck. Uh, We selected Sylvan Library. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's legal. Yes, it is. Okay. And it's, like, it's also a card to me that's, like... It's popular, but it also really speaks to Commander. Like, it's taking advantage of higher life totals. It's taking advantage of a slower pace of play. It's, like, part of what's attractive about it is green kind of struggles to get some amount of that effect. And so a card that can provide it for you has really high value over replacement. So I know I know the, I know these people play with it. Okay. I've seen it. Uh, we're going to the Pack Rat Award for Best Limited Card in the Set. I selected the Abyss. Uh, though I will note that like all the creatures suck. Right, it's so, sort of more of the same. Yeah, like the abyss is already a game rule. Yeah, in Legends, because what does it even matter? So I don't know. Uh, that I mean, that's just my best guess. It's kind of hard to figure out. Uh, you've got Gwendolyn de Corsi. Yeah, good luck beating that one. Okay, what that is this? card is game over. Is this the discard thing? Again? Yeah, <laughs> this is just a three five for four. Like. Where did those numbers come from? <laughs> those it, are that's like a real set of numbers. Is it only four mana? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's kind of hard to cast. Yeah. But yeah, it's really big for four mana. It, yeah, that's like that's in this set that's eight mana's worth of stats. And <laughs> sure, then if sure. if you if they don't kill it, which is impossible to kill, they're dead on the spot. <laughs> they have no chance of getting to anything good because the only things that can attack are eight mana. So if they're getting a card randomly discarded every turn, that's either going to be their big stuff or their lands. I think the answer should be killer bees, just yep. because I like watch. I I like the picture of the bee holding the shield and the sword. It's a great piece of art. And then you know who can stop a flyer? No, that card is probably quite good. Yeah, you know? yeah. Just every turn, for <laughs> every Five. green mana. Yeah, that's all they, I have. They're just looking at their lady orca. Just like, come on, just hold off three more turns, <laughs> and I can get this thing into play. Uh, we have the Char Rumbler Award for the weirdest card in the set. Uh, mine with a little help from my partner here, is Chains of Mephistopheles. Yeah. Which, okay, so here's back in our coverage days in Legacy, Chains of Mephistopheles would come down, and the only thing I would always think to myself is, I really hope the opponent doesn't cast Brainstorm now. Right. Because if they do, it's all bad. Yeah. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's all bad. It's basically every card you draw beyond your natural draw yep you have to either discard a card or put a card from your hand on top of your deck okay so if you brains it basically if you brainstorm you just mind twist yourself you just lose the game yeah right you just immediately lose the game okay great um it showed up in legacy some i'm getting some like i don't know if you remember this i'm getting some like reed duke casting it in jund vibes absolutely in legacy like that's just the first thing that's coming to mind right now i don't remember if it was exactly him or not but, you know, this is very much in Reed's territory of black-based mid-range, one of in the sideboard. Just, yeah, blood-braided, blood-braided chains of mess and stuff. Yeah, or whatever. something like that. Yeah. Uh, okay, for you, do you remember what you put? <laughs> Tackle Maggot. All right, so I don't even know what this card does. Good luck. I know, I can see the picture. Get your glasses. In my head, and I know that it has a lot of text. So, where are you? Okay, here we go. I'm going to do a little reading today. Four mana enchant creature. Put a 0-1 counter on target creature during its controller's upkeep. If the creature is placed in the graveyard, its controller chooses a new target for Tackle Maggot. If there are no legal targets, Tackle Maggot becomes an enchantment and does one damage to the controller of the last creature Tackle Maggot was on during his or her upkeep. 
Tackle Maggot does not revert to a creature enchantment, even if other creatures are afterwards brought into play. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot going on. It's also, setting aside that it, it, it it's like really complicated for not a lot of play, once you do understand how it works, which, again, Eugene Harvey didn't know how this card worked. Okay. The card is not fun. Sure. <laughs> sure. It's just like every creature slowly dies. Yep. And then if you happen to be the last person left, you slowly die. die. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not that much fun. Uh, let's take a look, Ski, here at the uh, blank award for best card name in the set. For me, it's Yorika, which uh, is still in the Vintage Cube, even though it's not very good. Uh, I think... I think it has an exclamation point in the name. I want to check really quick. Mm, mm, no, it does not. Okay. Um, but it's got cool artwork. I think it's a cool name for a card. It should probably be blue instead of green, but, you know, that doesn't matter. And I like it. So that's my answer. Yours is? Adventurer's Guildhouse. Okay. I think it's like a, a, it's a sweet name sort of in general. Okay. It speaks to me. And also, I like the idea of, so you're setting up this uh, world where there's all these, like, legends, heroic stories going on, whatever. Sure. You would also imagine in that kind of setting, there would be lesser renowned, less powerful heroes that were still out there going on adventures and quests. And a little bit of that sort of showing that the world is not just about these demigods smashing into each other but also a name and piece of art that suggests, yeah, and there's also a level three fighter having a beer at a tavern before he goes, he's going to go off and slay some orcs is also kind of cool for setting up that world. Okay. And uh, that name really drives it home for me. Okay. Uh, last but not least, we have our John Avon Award for Best Land Artwork in the set. For me, it is Pendle Haven, uh, which I think has banger artwork in this particular set by Byron Wackwitz. I hope I, uh, excuse me, it's Brian Wackwitz. So I apologize for getting the name wrong. Uh, but kudos to you on some fantastic artwork. Yours is. I, I have one of his prints up there. Lava Tubes in Hammerheim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did a lot of early magic art. Yeah. Uh, mine is Teleria. Good artwork, horrible card. Yeah. But also, not. It's first of all, you don't have to put a whole lot on a land that taps for a blue to make it good. And anytime that Teleria's activate ability comes up, thank God. <laughs> this matters. One of my favorite designs in the set. Okay. Okay. Uh, as always, our really Furi our Rillius Fury Award for most overhyped card during previous season and Tarmogoyf Award for most underhyped card during previous season do not show up here, uh, given er Magic Show history. But, but it was Mana Drain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it wasn't that's, okay. That's probably true. Uh, which means we've got one thing left to do. All right, let's close her down. Uh, what card won the set for you? Soul Kanar, the Swamp King. Ooh, have you gotten an email answered yet? Uh, Soul Kanar? No, there's still there's still one answer. Throwing a bone, still no yeah. answer. Okay, uh, why did this win? Because it's a legend. Okay. It is gold. It is sort of aspirational in terms of building around it but you can also just play it as it is. And the rate is actually enough for you to consider going out of your way to cast it. The To me, the fundamental failing of the set is, you know, we've been going over it and laughing about it. The big legends are so bad, even, and it's not even like a 2023 thing. They were bad in 1994. Sure. These cards were horrendous at all times. And it's it, it is sort of, it does dampen the enthusiasm of seeing all these gold cards, storyline characters. A lot of these designs are trying to convey personality either through the text box or the um, uh, the flavor text or whatever, the art, all of it. Yep. And so many of them are just dead on arrival because they're not even in the zip code of playable at any point. And Soul Kanar is one that's, you, if you opened it, you'd be like, oh, like this is sweet. Um the you know I, I think there's a fine case to be making for the elder dragon legends but they are like a lot more of the same compared to big creatures with drawbacks and mana cost or whatever it's it's you know 
magic early magic has a lot of that going on soul canar feels like wow could the set just use like way more of this uh but because it's not there it really stands out as uh, a great and fun design so i agree with basically everything you just said and so far as the legends are just not so bad they're they're just really really not powerful cards my answer however is going to be a legend which that doesn't come as much of a surprise given the set i'm gonna go with stang and here's why that card's cool and when i first started playing magic and ran into that card and chromium and some of the other cards from the set i was just like that card's cool it wasn't about like oh well i only play like black and blue cards so i can't play with stang or it wasn't like um well i only play instants and sorcery so i'm not gonna play with staying i was like i don't know that card's sweet it is sweet you know and it's like is it even that good no it's not but it's got cool artwork it's got like a cool thing where it's like i get two of these that's rad and it's just i don't know it's just cool looking at this card and my, my other answer would have been chromium chromium's horrible yeah it's just not a good card at all but it's like look at this metal dragon yeah. it's just gonna kick your ass Except for it's not, because it's never going to get to attack. Mm-hmm. And I'll be lucky if I can pay the upkeep. Or cast it. How about that? But that's what this set to me is all about. It's just like these cards are mostly bad, but they were cool. Yeah. And coolness in the early stages of a game, especially when you're finding out about a game, that's important. Absolutely. It's really important. Now, as we transition to what grade do I give the set, this is a very hard question for me to answer. But it's not going to get a high grade for me. I'm going to give it a six. Now, there are some things I really like about Legends. Uh, First of all, introducing Legends as a card type, A+. Mm -hmm. Love it. Execution of Legends as a card type, like a D? I don't know if that's too harsh or not. Oh, I, I give it an F. Okay, okay. Um... I'll let you st- maybe D minus because like elder dragons are cool, but like if you took the elder dragons out, I would give it an F. Okay. So that idea, cool. Legendary the legend uh the legendary lands, similarly, I think that's a cool idea. Execution, not great. Um if I look at the legendary rule, I actually understand why the legendary rule existed the way that it did from a storyline aspect, but if you take away the storyline aspect and put it into how does this actually work? in practice and gameplay, it's a horrible rule. But as you mentioned, it didn't come up until it did come up and then it was a problem, right? And they had to change it. Uh, Rampage sucks. It just doesn't matter. Bands with others sucks. That's that's not anything. Um, What other, the world enchantments? I wasn't there, so I can't say. I'm not a big believer in uh, a card which rules is this doesn't matter until the second card with the exact same tag gets played. Okay. There's okay. nothing there unless like randomly uh, the other person makes it happen. Sure. Now, if I'm looking at other mechanics really quick, poison, whatever, it's a different way to win. It's fine. They didn't do it too much, which I think is actually a good thing. There's various counter types, whatever the things that they introduced and then multicolor cards, which is huge. And of course is still in magic's history. So, you know, legends, and legendary lands and then the multicolor cards they, those have made it through magic's history but the initial execution of these things was not particularly well done and this might sound a little harsh but i'm just going to go with it this is what happens when like you have a fan design a thing right as opposed to the people who design stuff for a living now it's early so i understand that like they're probably their design teams and development teams weren't like fully formed everything but like if I'm having like being in charge of just like, hey, you're fans of the games you got and you want to work on this, okay, cool, and we're gonna go with your product, there's probably gonna be some holes in your product. And that's what I think we see here. So I I give this set a five. Okay. And, and this, similarly I think that's your lowest score. Um I think so far. Okay. And it's kind of similar to yours in so far as there's a lot of very high watermarks and a lot of like Fs. Okay. So uh legends and gold cards huge huge deal um they have really good incentives they allow you to present the cards differently they give you an opportunity for your storyline characters to be more substantial uh they in i like pushing people towards playing fewer copies of the same card all that is really really good uh rampage 
is like who is this for sure this is like triple blocking is not a part of magic at all <laughs> certainly at this point you okay. can get barely you can barely get anyone to play with any creatures in the first place sure who is sure. this what problem is this trying to solve um the uh so rampage quite weak uh, and sort of pointless um the poison thing is really weird to do an alternate win condition on like a one-off common in a set of 300 something cards okay now that seems like the the type of thing that if you're going to do it you're going to like lean into it sort of so i there's a little push pull there for me because it's like i like introducing i get this from you but it's mm. like try a little bit of it and see how it goes it is a weird time to introduce it though well doing a little bit of a mechanic that is just like there's an alternate win condition and it's just literally how many times can you hit this button mm-hmm. is like uh you actually need to do some of it to make it happen at all okay so it's kind of a weird thing to do as a one-off design um but that stuff aside it, what's even worse to me than like the rampage stuff maybe the initial legends rules whatever is like the number of cards in this set that are powerful and miserable and sure. that is part of the reason yes there's some architectural issues with the set and that could speak to people who were not professional designers uh designing a lot of the cards but that does not explain mana drain nether void the abyss caracas moat. arborea moat yeah. j- chains of mephistopheles like the cards in the set that are actually like tournament level cards by and large are horrendous experiences sure the number like what are the cards in here that are like reasonably powerful and like kind of fun it's like chain lightning i'm i'm looking is there underworld dreams yeah it's like I, I mean, that card got banned i don't know how fun that card was you know, restricted or restricted right? sure yeah. but like, i i can't imagine it was that fun if it was being restricted if you think black vice could be fun then that's sort of fun okay like uh, uh, but it's just there's just like the cards in here that are strong are horrible cards to make strong and that to me is uh worse than the architectural problems okay and that to me is like why the why why i have to give it a low grade i guess the question one would have to ask themselves is once this card once this set gets released right and then gets into the ecosystem how much more fun are people having with this set being added to the ecosystem of magic there's that's a great point and it's not fun and it's also the reason why i think it sort of supersedes the the like weaknesses of legend like the legend creatures is like okay so what if they were stronger would it have made any difference at all with mana drain the abyss nether void moat moat, sure just like these cards are so powerful against cards that are expensive and creatures that if you made a set built around expensive creatures there it's just there's it's a non-starter sure so uh i do but i do want to give a lot of praise to gold and legends those are big steps those those are huge huge, steps huge Huge steps steps forward um but yeah the the cards are the cards that are supposed to be fun are really really weak and the cards that are supposed to be weak are actually the best cards in the set yeah and you know like some of this is plotted by having the 30 year history of magic we know like what's coming and stuff like that but like you know the reason i don't give this set like a three or a four or something like that is because of gold and because of legends and just what those have established for the game which are still going on you know when we did our podcast of cold snap it's just like hey this is inexcusable yeah like what's happened here given that the game has been around for so long this there's clearly some mistakes and some misses but there are some hits and when when i say hit i mean like still happening 30 years later and, and are things that people look forward to with every set which is this set's gonna have gold cards cool what are they right or this set's gonna have legendary creatures cool what are they and that is um that's a win in my book yeah that's a huge win yeah uh, and i guess it offer a little bit more clarity of what i'm talking about because these these early sets have um the issue right of the power levels in the wrong place both because the power level outliers are way too good and also the cards that are powerful are the wrong kind of cards to be powerful but there is a difference between you know let's say the moxes and black lotus Mm -hmm. not sustainable cards to balance your game around long term um they do encourage some some stuff that is not great but they are fundamentally proactive cards you have a burst of mana and then you try to do things 
with your burst of mana. And usually when you're ahead on mana, what you want to do is proactive stuff. Mm-hmm. You can't do moxes forever, but in terms of what kind of card is going to be really way too good to start with, it's not the worst bet. The Abyss and Netherboid Mana Drain are all about like, oh, did you try to take a game action? Sure, You're sure. dead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, or it's like if you're playing against, if you are if you have a deck of like commons and uncommon creatures and you just like just started playing, there's a very good chance that you literally cannot beat the Abyss. Like sure. your opponent plays it and it, you- The game is over. You cannot beat it yeah. with the cards that you want. Yep. And that stuff is so much worse than balancing around moxes, even though like, yes, the moxes are more powerful than the Abyss or Mana Drain. Yep. But- um, it's like among Magic's early sets, it's the most calibrated in the wrong direction. And all of them are kind of calibrated in the wrong direction, mm-hmm. degrees. Mm-hmm. And this one stands out as being especially poorly calibrated. Thank goodness for gold cards and legends. We agree there. So let's put a final wrap by doing a little bit of advertising and marketing. Um, if you liked what you saw here, you can uh, click on the subscribe button or like or share or ring the bell all the things that you can do on youtube we're over five thousand subscribers now on youtube so we want to thank each and every single one of you for watching and enjoying the program not only the resleevables also but also the pre-sleevables that we did mm-hmm. for march and machine and the unsleeved podcast which you can find over on our patreon which you can subscribe to as well over at patreon.com slash the receivables where you will get episodes of the receivables ahead of time you will get access to cool uh, items like play mats and stickers and sign lands by Patrick and I. And of course you will get complete access to the unsleeve podcast, as I mentioned previously. Now, uh, as for a couple of other fun things that we are doing here with the show, number one, we're going to, uh, we're going to have to break those boosties mm-hmm. in that video that you guys are going to be able to check out here. So looking forward to doing that in our other studio. And I mentioned the other studio because We are finishing up a gameplay studio in which you're going to be able to watch us play the 1994 Magic the Gathering (laughs) World Championship Finals. Um, We wanted to add gameplay uh, to this show, but as you have probably figured out, the first handful of episodes that we did with ABU, Antiquities, and uh, Arabian Nights, there were no tournaments to cover. Now, in the previous version of the receivables, we would go over the tournament results of the Grand Prix and the Pro Tours and the World Championships that aligned with a set being the newest set. Well, Legends is the first one that we can do that with. So we will be bringing you some gameplay on YouTube here over the next handful of days. And we'll be starting with some truly horrible decks. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's going uh, it, to let, let me put it this way. If we don't allow, if we're not permitting ourselves to mana weave our decks, mm-hmm. I have a feeling we're going to have a tough time getting the game off the ground. Well, I got all day. All right. I don't mind. So uh, we hope you look forward to uh, us breaking those Italian Legends packs, uh, playing the 1994 uh, Match of the Gathering World Championship finale. And uh, our next episode after this, it's the dark. Really I fun set. I can't see. Yeah. I don't know how big it is. It's a smaller set. It's okay. A, we're back to eight card boosters. Okay. Um, there's like very few good cards. Tone is incredible. Okay. Some of my favorite art in all of magic is in the dark. Okay. Um, a handful of bangers. I think ball lightning is probably more fun than any card in the legends. So you're already starting off. Ball lightning's a banger. That's from the dark. banger. Yes. I didn't know that. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So you will, we'll rebound into something, you know, not quite as much depth in terms of mechanics, probably not as much depth in terms of sort of the meta development of magic sort of behind the scenes at the time, but like, wow, there are cards you can read and they're not horrible. Perfect. <laughs> Can't wait for that. Probably a shorter episode too. So thank you all very much for sticking with us throughout this entire long and complete episode of Legends. As I mentioned, more content coming. We appreciate your subscriptions, your views, your shares, and all that jazz. And we will see you back here for the dark next time. What is the deal with Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> Let me check this. I think I need to get tools on the right. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> what the hell is going on with Barbara? <laughs>
<laughs> who, who is this? <laughs> Don't worry about who it is. I want answers. Uh, I got so many good. Drew Walker. I don't think you ever met him, but uh, he was a designer over at Cryptozoic, and he got his foot in the door doing customer service at Upper Deck. Okay. And just over the summer, the same two kids would just crank call him all the time. Really? <laughs> he got a call once. Uh, the kid's like, he's like, hello, Upper Deck, Yu Gi Oh! Customer Service. And the kid's like, guess how many copies of Blue Eyes White Dragon I have? And Drew goes, <laughs> I don't know, three, and the kid goes, seven! See, <laughs> 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 oh, come on! How many blue lines? <laughs> like, trying to do that.